Well, seeing as how Mark's not here, I'll uh, kick the meeting off. He may be just a little bit of de a little bit delayed, um, so we'll, we'll call to order the meeting for Monday, January seventeenth, uh, Martin Luther King Day, and uh, I see there's something here on the agenda. I want to take a moment to remember Martin Luther King and his plight to. Uh, you know, bring bring justice to to all people in this country. Um, Mark did recording in progress. Reach out, and he said that Dairy Farm has the road blocked, so he might he's going to be a little bit late. Okay. Um, and I did write something, and I asked um, Carla to put that on the agenda for Martin Luther King. So something you'd like to read? Yeah. Perfect. Sure. Sweet. Um, you got the floor then. Thanks. <laughs> um. Uh, so I just, just some notes of wanting to take a minute to make sure, since we are here on MLK Junior Day, to honor and celebrate his life and legacy and contributions to America's civil rights movement. Um, Dr. King envisioned a world where all people felt valued, respected, and supported regardless of their sex, age, race, ethnicity, national origin, abilities, sexual orientation, gender, identity, economic status, education, or political perspective. Um, he recognized that inequities and inequalities existed within laws, policies, and practices, and he and other civil rights activists advocated for change through legislative process. I feel like that's just important for us to recognize that that's what we're here working to do as well. They strove for equality and human rights for black Americans, the, the economically disadvantaged, and for all victims of injustice through peaceful protests, grassroots organizing, and civil disobedience. Though his life was tragically cut short, Dr. King's accomplishments impact us to this day. His successes continue to guide civil rights movements in the present and serve as a model for how we can combat injustices and inequities. A quote that stood out to me reminds, us, reminds me of our work on the select board and goes as follows. The ultimate measure of a person is not where they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where they stand at times of challenge and controversy. His, uh, his words throughout his time here, I think, I wish they would resonate worldwide. I'm sure they do in some countries, but there's so much uh, mistreatment of humans to humans throughout this world, entire world. Uh, it's, it's a difficult challenge to... Uh, Change, but he certainly put in a lot of effort for it. There he is. That's okay, Mark. So I'll let you pick up from here. That way, we haven't really got into the agenda or anything. Just okay. about to approve the agenda. So. Okay. Right, Chris or Mark. I just want to add. I I think it was very eloquent what Dan just said. Uh, I think we should have in the minutes that we dedicate this meeting to uh, everyone in this country and in the world <coughs> who uh, seek to uh, provide in, in, well, all racial people will live together. And I also love that Dr. King believes it should be done in a nonviolent way, which I think is really important uh, to his memory. So we have not approved the agenda here. Nope, that's where we're at. Okay. Um, are there any changes to the agenda? There hasn't been suggested any, unless Bill's got something. You oh. good, Bill? I'm all set. I guess okay. we're good. Uh, I'll take a motion. So moved. Second. Second. It's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Consent agenda items, minutes from January 10th meeting. Move the consent agenda item. Okay, there's a second. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 It's a public comment portion of the meeting. I'm not sure if anyone's here or on Zoom that would like 
an opportunity to speak. This is for anything that's not on the agenda, but we will also make sure the public has an opportunity to speak to any agenda item. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak during this time? All right, we'll move on to select board items. Consideration of possible repeal of the Town of Waterway Ordinance regarding the Act 250 review designation, which is this specific to the, it didn't go into the paper? Yep. Correct. Right. Yeah, so um, as I wrote in my memo yesterday uh, or Saturday, uh, this didn't get published. Uh, Steve is here, he can talk more to it. Uh, we did contact our attorney and uh, he said, given what the law says, you've got to publish it again. You've got to actually readopt that or, you know, make the motion to repeal that ordinance again. So, Steve, I think I've covered it, but you can take it from there if you want. Sure. So um, this is kind of an unfortunate uh, circumstance. and. Um, I communicated with uh, Dr. McDougall and Dr. Petrosky over the weekend. I wanted to make sure they were aware this was on the agenda. Um, if you recall back in the middle of November, um, you considered the repeal of our ordinance regarding Act 50 review designation. Um, the repeal would uh, change Waterbury to from a one acre threshold for Act 250 jurisdiction on commercial projects to a 10 acre threshold uh, because we have subdivision bylaws. And uh, so, unfortunately, what happened is we submitted a um, notice that our attorney helped us draft that had to be published in the newspaper or a newspaper within 14 days of your decision. Well, in the newspaper of record, which is newspaper of record, correct. No, that, I'm sorry. That, that's correct. Yes, thank you. So um, we submitted it early in uh, the week, the Thanksgiving week, uh, to the Times Argus. I got a proof on Wednesday from their uh, rep that we work with uh, all the time on these notices. Uh, I approved the proof and uh, looked at the paper early the next week. It was to be published in, in the Saturday paper on the 26th. So it was within the 14 days. I checked early next week. I couldn't find it. I asked Pam in our office who does the interaction around billing with the time targets if she could try to find out if it ran or not because I, you know, we didn't really know if I hadn't been able to find it in the paper or something. So at any rate, uh, we went back and forth with the time targets. They actually billed us for the publication of the <laughs> ad. So there was a lot of uncertainty. Ultimately, last month, they told us it did not run in the paper. This rarely happens, but unfortunately it happened. So uh, I talked to Bill about it last week. Uh, we agreed to contact our attorney. He said, well, the state statute requires that the notice be uh, in the paper record within 14 days of your decision, even though we had posted it in five places and everything. We, um, he said, uh, it needs to come back to the select board and get reapproved and, and go through the process again. So that's where we are this evening. We put it on the agenda. And um, what I've passed out is the uh, the notice that you would sign. It's different than the one that goes in the paper. That's more uh, descriptive about the ordinance that's being repealed. But this is the document that um, would be the subject of a motion to, um, to repeal the ordinance. And um, yeah, and, so that's and the story. Just so everyone knows and everyone is clear, all of the provisions of the law apply. So the, the, you have to, if you want to repeal the ordinance, it's as if it hadn't been done. So, you do all the posting so again. You've, got to, you've got to repeal it again. It's got to be posted. It's got to be published. And we have to wait for 60 days before it becomes, uh, before it's effective in the 44 days that is out there for people to petition to overturn. So it's as if you didn't do this. And um, we feel badly um, slipped through the cracks. It happened. So. Just to be clear on the um, the 44 day, that would be a petition for a town wide vote on the repeal of the ordinance. Right? The petition doesn't take action. It just is a petition for a town wide vote. Right. And there were no petitions 
the last time we did this. So I would hope there won't be another one this time, but it's just unfortunate, but you've got to go back to the beginning as if it didn't happen. So. Doesn't necessarily mean we need to re-enter the discussion. It's just we re and move it forward again. Right. Can I have a second? Sure. I'm kind of, it's unfortunate that, it, you know, that we are back at the table with this thing again, but yet I, uh, I'm kind of happy we are because I wanted, last time I voted no. Um, and I didn't get a chance to explain why. I think things were kind of moving along a little bit too fast. It's not that I object to the fact that we're doing this. <clears throat> I'm more concerned about the fact that the one acre threshold just moves into 10 acre threshold with no changes of what seemed to be fairly uh, easy hoops to, to jump through for the one acre threshold. And with the 10 acre threshold now coming into play, uh, I'm concerned about the fact that the town has not, and it's to no fault of any applicant in the past that has you know, been upset about this one acre threshold, wish it were 10. I know several people spent a lot of money like fires and perils and other people like that spent a lot of money to get through the Act 250 process because of the one acre threshold. But I'm, you know, I don't know where this process is in the planning commission's eyes if they're planning on reviewing the criteria of the one acre threshold that will now become the 10 acre threshold to do anything in terms of tightening up any of the, you know, bringing in some more criteria to, to deal with the things that probably weren't prevalent under the one acre, but now could be under the 10 acre. Um, and as I said before, I think the reason this kind of was forced to the table this time is because we've got another applicant that you know, is in that gray area where probably his project's not going to be a huge impact. Uh, and the, I think the town has, hasn't has had the time to deal with this in the past the way we probably would have liked to have. Um, so now, you know, we're taking a little bit of a risk uh, moving this into the 10 acre without any review of of that criteria. So. You know, I'll probably vote yes on it this time, but I just wanted something to be in the minutes to explain why I'm not really 100% comfortable with it. Um, and from the from Steve, your your perspective, Steve, is the planning commission is it on their radar or is it not even an issue at this time? Yeah, it, Chris is definitely on their radar. Um, in fact, uh, Duncan and John came and spoke. With the planning commission about this issue, we had a couple of very good discussions. Uh, I think Mary Cohen attended one of your discussions, uh, or um, I know it was uh, Steve Karcher actually who came. And um, and the planning commission, you know, has raised some of the same concerns that you have, Chris. And I think um, we do now have draft unified development bylaws. Nothing has been enacted, but um, there. Um, working right now, for instance, on this phase one, which um, includes some revisions to the design review bylaws that will deal with some of the historic issues. So I think they're they're working on some of the building blocks for stronger bylaws dealing with things like historic resources. The Conservation Commission is working with our Planning Commission around natural resources in um, some areas, uh, just the wildlife corridor, for instance. So I think it's um, it's definitely on the planning commission's radar. There's no question about it. I think uh, the bylaw amendments um, take take time, and especially when you're doing a comprehensive rewrite, and they have not gotten to site plan review, conditional use review, some of the other reviews that um, are applicable. Um, certainly, site plan review to every commercial project, uh, conditional use review is part of many commercial. Uh, application uh, reviews. So I think they're they're definitely working on it, and it will, probably will 
will be a while, but um, I think this will give some incentive, to be honest, for them to dig in and um, and with the discussion and with that need, I think that will help bring that um, to the table, if you will, and um, to get some bylaws in place and in front of you as a draft. So, well, on behalf of them, I know of probably any of the commissions that we have in this town, they're they're getting more curveballs thrown at them than probably anybody, <clears throat> you know, as far as what they're what they're being asked to do in short periods of time. You know, it seems like every time they turn around, they're having to leap through their butt to you know, pass some uh, uh, interim bylaws, or you know, their scope of work never seems to, to lessen. Yeah, so, it goes. Yeah. Yeah, and they are working on issues that will benefit from for housing, for instance, providing more opportunities for uh, affordable housing and higher density housing. So I think they're they they do have some priorities in the village area discussion. So we'll we'll keep working on it. All right. Well, I appreciate the time, Mark. Yeah, no problem. And, and and just so you know, I'm not sure if the board is aware, but Steve and Alyssa and I met after another meeting here and we discussed exactly the concern that you, you're expressing which was what is the planning commission's feeling towards this decision and does it put them in a position that they don't want to be in and that from what i got my reading was yes there's some work that this is going to potentially force the planning commission to take on but from a concern from the number of properties and what ultimately the impact would be seemed to be where there seemed to be a comfort at least at the table from that meeting that this is an okay decision to move forward with and the planning commission was willing to take on this as an additional work towards the rewrite of the zoning the zoning rewrite and just the ability to if i have any concerns over this 10 to one acre distinction between when actually it triggers. It seemed like there was a comfort level there that we could move forward as a select board and make this decision and not necessarily put the planning commission in a position where they felt totally overwhelmed. Am I correct to say that? Yeah, I, there was a mixed um, view on the behalf of the planning commission. Sure. Some members felt this was premature. <laughs> um, you know, other members, uh, Steve Karcher, Alyssa, we're, we're fine with it. So I think that they're, they didn't make a recommendation about this to the select board because they didn't have consensus around it. So that, to be honest, that's where they are. But, uh, but I think they're fully aware of the issue and, and uh, will certainly work on these kinds of uh, bylaws that will address some of these criteria that aren't currently addressed in a very yeah, full way. I just hate to see at some point down the road Somebody come back and say, you know, you guys didn't deal with this. Now look, now look where we're in, you know. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yep. we can move forward. And Fortunately, you know, the quality of development and proposals in this community, to be honest, is generally very good. I think we're fortunate, and uh, we got a proposal for the re reconstruction of the stone shed right now, which is like beyond my wildest dreams of what might have happened. <laughs> so, you know, I think we're really lucky in this town, and we're lucky that people really take care of a lot of the older historic buildings uh, to a large degree. So there's always risk in any, if, with privately owned property, sure, that's the nature of, of it. But I think we'll, and the DRB is very good and, and right now it's very strong, diverse, and I think they try hard to keep the quality of development good. Mike? I still, I'm still very much in favor, so but my question is more of a technical one. Um, I hate to say it, Times Argus screwed up. <laughs> People all do screw up, but I think, you know, we're a customer of theirs. We should be comped the cost of that, that advertisement. Well, Not, they didn't charge us for the- Well, the point of Steve, you said for, they were very well, bill. Well, they sent us a bill, but we didn't pay it. We're not gonna pay it. No. Okay, but mm -hmm. when the next bill comes yeah. out, I don't, I, I think yeah, this should be a freebie. Well, they're still going to provide the service. Well, yeah. they're going to provide the service, but you know what, there's, you know, if, if you're a business, you know, this has cost us money because we had to consult with attorneys and stuff like that. It's not been a freebie. So, you know, 
Well, my personal opinion. We can see what we can do. Yeah, we can do that. You could ask. Even if we get a discount or something like that, I think it's well worth asking. Any further discussion from the board or take a motion? Um, so I might need help on the wording, but is it just uh, a move to repeal the town of Waterbury ordinance <laughs> regarding active 50 yeah. review designation? That's enough. Okay. I second that. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Great. So what I'd ask you to do is um, take one copy, just pass it around and um, sign it, and then we'll be all set. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Thank you all. Discussing uh, yeah, the format of the town in meeting. This is pertaining to. It sounds like on a state level they've allowed us to do what we did last year and have the option of doing. Um, yeah, Australian ballot. Is that yeah, Carla can fill you in. I've got some comments, but she should tell you what the deal is. All right. So, similar to last, just like last year, the House and Senate passed a bill to allow for all Australian ballots. And we're meeting with um, an informational meeting 10 days preceding March 1st. And the governor signed that into legislation late last week. So, it's not mandatory. But it's what a lot of towns are doing. You can still do an in person meeting, or you can go to all training ballot. So, um, just so you know, there's, there's a couple of challenges. First, you know, we didn't have town meeting last year, it was all Australian ballot. We had high participation, we had reasonably good, reasonably good participation on the Zoom meeting. So I think it worked okay, um, but I think we missed the ability to have discussion about things and make changes. Um, the challenge for me this year, and it really isn't, um, well, the challenge is that town meeting is on March 1st. So next Monday, which is the 24th, you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to approve a warning on the 24th. We're not going to be finished with all of our budget stuff until probably the 31st. Um, after tonight, we'll have a lot better uh, handle on where we're going to be. Uh, I've got some questions and some comments that I'll make later after we review the budget, but we have some. Uh, we haven't talked about it yet, but there's a potential for some rather large, ex large expenditures. And are we gonna just put those in the budget? We haven't decided whether we're doing it or not, but I talked last week about an appropriation possibly for the ICE Center. We've got the $600,000 that uh, we, of our money that we wanna give, what, that I propose to uh, appropriate to the, to the EFUD. Um, there's a few other things. So I just want you to understand that uh, putting, it's pro and con, right? So if we have the meeting by uh, Australian ballot, a lot of people are gonna be able to vote on those things. And that's probably a better thing than a couple of hundred people voting from the floor at town meeting on appropriations that are very large. It's just how much are they going to know about what we're proposing? You know, so uh, I don't really have a recommendation. I'm just letting you know that you know I feel a little bit of angst about either one. Um, and uh, you know, the the who knows what the situation is going to be in, in March and how many people would be willing to come to a meeting in person, even if we had it. So. Uh, as I said, I don't have a recommendation, but it's just kind of those are things that you have to decide. You don't have to decide tonight. You will have to decide by Monday next week because the warning is going to have to say whether it's in person meeting or by Australian ballot. Right. But then as soon, as soon after the 24th is 
possible, I need to get the ballot sent there. No, I understand. So we have to. It's yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but if that's that's going to be a challenge anyway, because even if they decided tonight that they're going to have the meeting by Australian ballot, they're not going to have a warning tonight. Right. And that's going to have to wait till next week. So. And I can check on timing. We technically don't have to start voting until February night, 20 days before. Yeah. Um, so I can check on timing with the printer of you know, the drop dead days to get them the, right. the ballot. But the warning, even if the printer says, you know, well, you can wait until the first week of yeah, February, the warning, has to, be the warning to has to be done by the 28th of January because it's only 28 days in February and it's right. it's a 30 day warning period. So it, we're in the biggest, the most challenging crunch possible because of the calendar this year, because town meeting is March 1st. How far, what, what was the timing for the informational meeting last year? 10 days. We had it on the Tuesday preceding. Mm -hmm. Right. The pilot. You so that was seven days. <laughs> you have up to ten days. We okay. chose to do it on the Tuesday. Right. Okay. Do you call, recall the um, voter participation last year versus mm -hmm. a typical town meeting? Typical town meetings are seven to eight hundred, and I think we were at that, or maybe a little bit more, because we really got the word out to. Right, but the typical. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring it up. The typical town meeting, though, it's seven to eight hundred people who vote by Australian ballot. We yeah. don't have seven or eight hundred people meeting and discussing things from the floor. That's that's, that's right. usually 150, maybe 200 people or something like that. You know, they kind of come and go, but at at the peak time, we might have a couple hundred people in there. Is there any other votes? School votes or anything like there's that. There's going to be the school budget vote. Okay, so the Harvard Union Unified School District. There's also going to be a ballot that relates to the Central Vermont Career Center. They want to become their own district, and Harvard is one of the 16 districts that send kids to Spalding for um, the tech center. So, right, so are you going to have to set up voting booths? For both of those, no, well. they'll just the voters will get all three ballots. And oh, so we will. Well, if we have an in person town meeting, you'll have to set up voting. Groups. No, I meant if, yeah. if you could do all of that in Australian ballot by yeah. Australian the, ballot. The districts will provide the school ballots, okay. and they'll probably there's a bill pending governor's signature that will, um, we won't have to co-mingle the school ballots, mm -hmm. so they'll be run through the tabulations like last year for both. So last year on town meeting day itself, you had to set up ballot boxes at the school. So yeah, you... we still have to have in-person voting on town meeting day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., which we'll do at the school. My major concern with an in-person meeting is that we get half the time for voting mm -hmm. and town meeting gets the other half, so everybody's jammed in there. With Australian ballot, we just take the spread out of the time zone and then we were pretty safe about how we do that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's for, for safety and health reasons, having it all Australian ballot is, is the best. And for participation on the issues, it's best. It's just the question of how much information do the voters have when they go and there's no ability to discuss. We did have a good turnout though at the uh, informational meeting. The ability to discuss just comes a week early. 10, 10 days early, but right. there is ability to discuss. Right. right, but not change anything. Well, maybe after tonight, we'll get a better feel of whether there's difficult issues to deal with or it's the budget's pretty cut and dry. Yeah. You know, that may help us decide. Uh, obviously, I'm dying to get back to the old traditional town meeting because I'm sick of these things and want to do away with them. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm ready to take the risk, but I know a lot of people out there, you know, scared to death. So, uh, Bill, can you give an example of what the town? voters would see on a ballot when it pertains to how the e decision would read? Yeah, so there's 
there's two options whether we have an Australian ballot meeting or we have a, a traditional in person meeting. One option is you just put the money in the budget and it's just part of the you know, $2 million general fund budget. And if it passes, just like um, you know, in the budget, there's a line item for Memorial Day, there's a line item for the Senior Citizen Center. Uh, if so, you can just put it in the budget and there'd be a revenue and there'd be an expense and you'd explain about taxes. Or if you wanted to, you could have an article, a special article that said, shall the voters appropriate $600,000 of ARPA money to EFUD for the purpose of, uh, uh, you know, improving their, uh, its, water, its water and or sewer system. Uh, this appropriation is offset by ARPA funds and will have no impact on taxes. That's how in the old days, I can find you examples when we had bond votes where you'd have a bond vote and it would say, uh, shall the town bond for $3 million to build X, Y, Z. And uh, such appropriation will be uh, in effect netted out by proceeds of you know, a, a grant or what have you. So there's a way to make it clear that it won't cost anything, or you can just put it in the budget. Those are the two alternatives. Really. I'm, I'm much more in favor of some sort of a special article. Just, I think if you put it in the budget, a lot of people don't go through the budget, to be quite honest. You know, you know, some people just will always, if it's an Australian ballot, always vote no for a budget because they're conservative. So some people- People will don't just, go through the budget. Like, and, why the heck do I spend seven, <laughs> seven days a week for two months? Doing you, it? you know, we go through the budget and I think they, they have enough trust in the select board and some people who know, but and I think we kind of ferret out what the issues are. I think if there was a real question, I think when we're interviewed by the press and stuff like that, that stuff would come out. But I do think people, you know, I think like you get the school budget, you just hear about these big ticket items and you usually vote yay or nay. They don't go through the whole school budget. I'm just a realist. I, I understand. And there, there's risks both ways. I, I exactly. Think, I think we've had a pretty good track record here. And I think the public does trust that the board and I know what we're doing. So putting in the budget, uh, just as a line item in the budget, I think more than likely these things would pass. But if the board feels happier to, you know, call it out as a special article and call attention yeah. to it, you know, that's your prerogative. But anyway, those are the two options. When, and when, when, in your mind, the board, when does this decision, the format decision, need to be made? And then when does the decision about how we do the actual? Yeah, so the all of these decisions really are going to have to be no later than Monday next week, unless you want to have a special meeting. You can call a meeting on Thursday the 27th or whatever the day is and sign a warning that night. But you know, I'm hopeful that we can do it next Monday. So what will happen is um, Carla and I will will learn more tonight how you're feeling about things. But um, uh, so if you're thinking, if you're all thinking that we're going to do an Australian ballot meeting as opposed to an in-person meeting, if you know that now, letting us know that now will help us because Carla and I, I think, are going to probably have to write up two warnings. And if you, if you, um, if you don't know yet whether it's going to be an in-person meeting or an Australian ballot meeting, we might have to do two versions of two warnings. So I think next week, one of the things, if, if it's going to be an Australian ballot meeting, then we can bring a warning in that has everything in the budget and just the regular special articles that we always have there, you know, it's worth about $57,000 to special articles and everything else would be in the budget. Or 
I would have a budget with those things not in it and additional special articles. So we'd ha we'll have to bring two versions of a warning to you. But as I said, even though I prefer a in-person meeting, I understand there's pros and cons to it. Uh, if you know now as a board that we're gonna meet um, remotely, you know, the week before town meeting and then just have us join the if, if that's what you want now, let us know that. And it makes it, you know, a step less for us. The bill doesn't allow for any sort of amalgam of both, right? Like no. in between? You can't do it like red town. No hybrids, yeah. no. Can you like to have, have, the, have the owl? You can't, you can't have a hybrid because you're not able to, you're not able to verify who's voting by voice and everything else. So if you had a hybrid, you'd have the people at the meeting voting and then people on the remote wouldn't be able to, to vote. So it's either one or the other. It's either in person and you have to be there to vote or it's, uh, or it's all Australian ballot and you get to show up at a at an informational meeting. Is the informational meeting uh, strictly remote? Uh, it was last year, but I, I guess I'd have to look. At yeah, I don't, I don't know if the information meeting could be remote and uh, I mean hybrid. hybrid. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we'll have to look into that. But. So if we choose an in-person meeting, anyone who's voting, whether they stay for the meeting or not, has to attend, has to go in person to vote. Yeah, yeah, they can't. Well, sort of they can, they can always for the Australian. There, yeah. there's going to be Australian ballot. <laughs> items anyway all of the elections of officials the school budgets there will be australian ballot items and anybody can request an absentee ballot okay. and have one mail right, right. so items. the only thing that you miss if you have an in-person meeting uh, and you don't want to go in person you miss voting on the budget for the town the it's, budget the tax due dates. it's too bad we couldn't gauge the public on on their desire one way or the other um my fear is that this type of thing continues to move towards australian ballot for you know it's going to put a stake in the heart of traditional town meetings um, you know just one more one more bit of small town vermont disappearing and uh, unfortunate but the decision on a state level is for a single year correct yeah, yeah. it's just like last year yeah. this normally you have to vote at an open town meeting to go to australian ballot voting and then that stays in place until you then put it on australian ballot so you want to go back to you know uh, an open town meeting but because of covid the legislature passed this like the same legislation last year and this year, which will allow you to do it on your own motion, but next year, hopefully, Chris, um, this legislation won't be in place, and we'll yeah, have to with these. <laughs> right. um, Carla, is there, in your opinion, is it going to be excessively harder to do an in-house, a traditional meeting? No, that's what we've done all along. It's it's just the. It's the spacing yeah. out of yeah. uh, you know providing enough space for both the voting and the yeah, and meeting. I haven't talked with my VCA because the way we've been handling elections during COVID is to spread out the whole gym and block off each vote, voting booth has four spots for like these. Yeah. And we've been blocking off at least two, if not three, so only one person per booth. And if I do that at town meeting, it just will be right. A I'd hate really to slow process to get voters through. Yeah, I'd hate to go through that all and uh, end up having just a handful of people attend yeah. the meeting, well, you know, in person meeting. You know, that's, that's I I love. I think that's kind of a little what Chris says. I think that's one of the beauties of Waterbury that we do have an in person meeting. But I'm also scared as hell. You know, we don't know where COVID's going. You know. It's gotten worse. We don't know if it's going to get a little better by town meeting day. And I just don't know the comfort level. I'm curious 
I thought Chris had kind of an interesting thing. If there was some way to kind of gauge about, we don't really have, we don't have the time. Well, there really like a call in on DV or something like that. You know, how many people will listen to that? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't. I think, I, gonna be your I think yeah, you I, just got to make. It I think that's the point of us sitting here is that there's five of us that have been voted in to make these kinds of decisions. I think the state recognizes that this option should be available because of specifically the safety concerns. Right. So I think if the board, if everyone wants, either everyone can make a decision, or I mean, I, I think I know where I said. I think that I I didn't hear any real constituent complaints about what we did last year in terms of safety. I just don't think the risk versus reward. I mean, I, I agree with you, Chris. I, I look forward to us returning to the auditorium and having the town meeting day, but this is extenuating, extenuating circumstances that I just don't think that the risk makes sense. And I'm glad to hear we had at least, if not more, voter turnout. I think that was what I wanted to know before I kind of made a decision on where I would stand on it. but. If we think that we're getting just as much, if not more, participation and not putting anybody at risk for putting everyone in an auditorium, like to me, that makes sense. Yeah. My opinion is just getting having it as accessible to as many voters as possible. And it seems like our Australian ballot is what's going to do that this year in particular. Um, so that, that would be my vote or choice for the most access. I'm just too worried about people's apprehension about showing up. You know, as much as I would show up, I don't feel a problem. I feel everyone should be masked and stuff like that to go into a meeting. I think spacing could work, but I think there's a, there are a lot of people. We have a lot of older older people in our community who are just going to have apprehensions. And I, I, I don't know where the pandemic's going between now and the beginning of March and the, I think we just need to err on the side of caution. Yeah, so, I think the vast majority of the people that do show up at the traditional town meetings are mm -hmm. of the older generation. It is. It's you know, it's it's, I, it's not a young person. You three have already kind of made the decision. I think. Uh, I'm sure the Australian <laughs> <laughs> So, I think we're there. And well, well, obviously, obviously, Australian with with an informational meeting. Yeah, yeah, we have, we have, we have, yeah. that's yeah. part yeah. of the law. And I think you know, hearing that. Making a decision this evening would just help the, you know, the town yeah. office move on every motion that needs to happen after that decision. I don't think is there any reason to delay that decision. Yeah, you don't. You don't have to make a motion tonight because yeah. I think that's the consensus. Everybody's in agreement. We'll prepare the warning that way, and it will be warned. But I think everybody should know. Yeah. If you want to make a motion, you can, but. You can't warn anything, right? Because we don't have a warning. So, yeah. just one more thing. The other unfortunate part is, will this be your last town meeting? Well, it'll be the last town meeting that I'm the municipal manager. To have a traditional meeting and have you there and have people, you know, show their appreciation. Well, um, appreciation, I don't believe. Well, <laughs> there, there could be some of that as well. You know, but, uh, Phil Lump is so cynical. I think, uh, I think that you know, for me, it's uh, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, it's it's unfortunate from my perspective too. Uh, you know, uh, I missed it last year, and and then because of the circumstances, it's it's much more even bitter this year. But I think it's the right thing to do. And, yeah. Uh, we'll make it so, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so no motion, but sounds like there's consensus, consensus on one. Yeah. So, all right, uh, moving on. Managers items, uh, managers items, library budget. Okay, so. Rachel Mews is here. She's the library director. Uh, she's right there. And Christine Wolf was here. Yeah, she's there. She's in person. Oh, there she is. And we're right on time. She's in the Duncan Duels. So, anyway, I uh, sent out the library, the budget that the library directors, uh, the library commissioners worked with Rachel and, and me with, uh, and 
I'm just going to let Rachel and Christine take it from here. And if there's help they need, I'll weigh in. But uh, I think it's fairly straightforward. Yeah, I'm happy to get started with this. Um, it is pretty straightforward. Um, I think everybody's hopefully had a chance to read the document that that Bill circulated. I think he laid it out really, really well. Um, we are at this year in 2023 looking to request the tax appropriation of $485,575 be submitted to the voters. Um, this is an increase. Um, our total proposed spending for 2022 would be $540,845. Uh, that would include the uh, appropriation from the library trust fund, as well as the uh, funds we've received from the taxpayers. Uh, that total spending amount would be 6.4% of the 2021 budget. Uh, why are we looking for a little bit more funding? It's a couple of large uh, lines that are uh, needing to increase in the coming year, and it really is a necessity. Uh, we need to increase funding for our uh, two MDOF line, which is the line that covers the operating expenses and building maintenance. Um, and people know that the library is, I think it, it's 53% of the town yeah. building complex here. So that's a uh, fairly significant uh, piece of property that needs to be maintained. Um, and as Bill outlines here, there were some significant expenses uh, when it came to building maintenance, maintenance in the past year that we now need to sort of be planning for for the future as we move forward uh, to sort of make up for the expenses that were uh, expended in the past year. <laughs> Uh, the other significant increase would be around personnel expenses. Um, we've had a lot of turnover at the library, as folks know, including myself, and I think we had three other fires in the past year. Um, that means that with some of the resignations and then some of the firings, we've had to, to uh, increase the funds that are being spent on those salaries a little bit to get people, to get those salaries up to kind of market standard for libraries in the vicinity. Um, and then if for the coming year, we also have to plan for, you'll see a kind of an interesting line for um, part-time pay, which has increased a fair amount. And that covers um, what we call subs, substitutes who uh, cover for librarians when they're out. And I don't know how much time all of you spend in the library, but you may know that we have a staff member who's pregnant who's going to be out on maternity leave for a big chunk of the coming year. So we need to prepare for, for her absence. Um, so those are the only really major increases we're requesting. You can uh, ask me about any of the other lines if you see anything that you wonder about, but we, I really did try to maintain fairly steady rates and on those lines because we really are um, kind of catching up, <laughs> you could say, for uh, what the past couple of years look like. And in fact, um, our year-end fund balance in the libraries is about $16,000. Uh, so that's nice to be able to kind of be take a little bit of uh, the burden off of the taxpayer for the coming year. Um, and that's kind of a long and short of it. If anybody has specific questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them and Christine's here as well. What are staff numbers this year compared to last year? If you factor in all the, the part-time people and such. Um, that's where one of our increases is, and that's mostly due to some salary increases. The staff numbers are the same, okay. the same yeah. number of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we aren't looking to increase staffing at all at this time, or even increase hours of staffing. I am very much hoping that this year the library will be open every <laughs> week, just like normal at full hours, and so far it's looking good for that. I did uh, put that column just to the right of the 2022 proposed budget and where it says no leave I, I was just trying to show you that there's really just kind of an offset that if uh, if if there wasn't somebody that was going to be on uh, long-term leave or uh, family leave that line item instead of 227 860 would be 233 285 but the ten thousand dollar line would only be forty eight hundred, so it's it's not quite a, an exact wash. But uh, I just wanted to let you know that it's it's not a big savings, and the fact that the uh, part time pay is up a lot isn't going to hurt us. The part time pay last year um, was you can see that same thing. It was twice as much almost as what was budgeted, but it was uh, up 
less than what the regular pay was down and the regular pay was down because we had so much turnover so they kind of balanced each other out are you feeling more confident now about salaries are matching um we're getting there yes it, it was, i think that with the turnover and, and that also means we've uh hired uh more <laughs> folks who have uh, more of a professional library background which is great to see so we really kind of up the professionalism of our full-time librarians which is wonderful i hope we will help with retention i really hope yeah. so i think so i feel really good about the team we have now um people seem to be very happy there and it's, it's just a great environment so i think we're looking good for this coming year so overall, the budget increases. Well, it, I got some scribble notes here. Um, it looks like somewhere around plus forty thousand uh, with a thirty thousand dollar draw off from your trust. Is that correct? Well, the budget last year was five hundred eight, and it's five forty eight forty five this year. So that's about what thirty two thousand dollar increase, and as as Rachel said, it's it's about a six percent increase on the spending side, and they, you know, I did ask the commissioners to try to up the um, the transfer from the trust a little bit, so it went from uh, fourteen thousand two fifty five in two thousand twenty to twenty six three sixty five in twenty one, and now thirty thousand dollars this year. Um, and you know it's a it's a 10.7 percent tax increase and there's no way of getting around that but i did put next to that number there that in 2020 the last year that we budgeted prior to covid um the tax the tax ask at that time was 484 430 so essentially you know 1100 1200 less than it is now so the, the tax rate went down in 2021 because we had so little spending that happened in 2020 and we had a big uh, beginning fund balance. We had almost a $41,000 fund balance because the uh, spending just didn't happen in 2020. And we basically brought all that fund balance forward and was able to drop the taxes significantly. Um, so uh, it's, I look at it as we're kind of back to where we were. If you say, you know, if a, if a uh, tax request in a, in a period from 2020 to 2022 went up $1,200 on a $485,000 I mean, a five hundred and forty thousand dollars budget would be pretty happy about mm -hmm. that. So I think it makes sense. So, so my question, I guess, is to take an additional uh, funding off in the the uh, portfolio to uh, their trust fund to right. their trust fund. Yes, from their their fund to water this increase down a little bit. Um, how does that, is that anticipated to do the same thing next year to keep that in place or because if, if it's a one-time, you know, infusion of money now, next year it'll have to be made up some other way. Um, yeah. So I'm Well, the, the library trust fund, and I didn't bring the balance sheet, but it's, it's at about $650,000, close to that. <coughs> um, so, um, you know, six hundred thousand dollars, ten percent would be sixty thousand, and thirty thousand is about a five percent. So they're taking about five percent of the trust fund and sharing it with the taxpayers. That's the same percentage that we're doing uh, with the tax stabilization fund. So, you know, they could take more. I mean, if 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 you say, well, we're only going to give you, uh, you know, four hundred and Eighty thousand dollars of tax money, or you know, split the difference between last year and, and you know, give them four hundred and sixty. Then the commissioners have to make a decision whether they're going to cut the budget or increase the the appropriation from the um, from the from the trust fund. Uh, the concern that you have with that is that the trust has been growing, 
we haven't had a correction in the stock market in a long time now. And if you take a big amount out now and then it corrects, then you know you're gonna you're gonna you know drop down. Now they have uh, I worked with the commissioners and they did rebalance the fund. They've got I don't know about 140, 150 thousand dollars of that uh, of that 650 or whatever it is in cash right now. So the whole the whole trust fund is not at risk. They you know they've taken some of that uh, cream off the top, so to speak. From my perspective, looking at it, Chris, uh, and I know it all adds up, we, and we haven't looked at everything together right now, but the, we'll get to it. The, the tax increase right now, if everything that I've done would happen, would be, you know, less than less than two less than three percent across the board. And there's some there's some discussion I want to have with you without with other revenues. So for me. When I put this budget together uh, last month, I kind of zeroed in on the thirty thousand dollar number to try to keep the two thousand twenty tax ask about the same as it is going to be in two thousand twenty two. So it's about eleven or twelve hundred dollars more in twenty twenty two asking the taxpayers than twenty twenty. And to me, given everything that I see universally, it it makes sense, but. You're the board. Christine is here. She hasn't said anything yet, but um, that's that's kind of. No, I mean our job is to ask questions. So oh, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm asking I'm, questions, I'm and, and I know that that's you know that one comment about you know what happens next year. There's other things at play. And I'm smart enough to know that. I know smart enough to know that they may not spend as much money next year. They may they may have additional revenues next year, which would go towards you know. Uh, Satisfying this current ask with something other than well appropriations okay. from their from their their fund. I, I'm not sure how much more revenue that they're going to generate. I mean, the library. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the revenue line, you know there's a, a four hundred eighty five thousand dollar tax request, a thirty thousand dollar trust fund, and everything else is less than five thousand dollars. And you know the grants that are available to the library are in that in that lower range there. Um, so there's not really going to be any chance for any additional revenues. Um, Can I stop you for a second? Yeah, sure. Was, Chris, was your question on the thirty thousand dollar line on the trust fund a thought that it should be a higher or lower number? No, that wasn't my my question. Is you're satisfying this? Uh, increase in the budget this year with money from that fund, okay. Uh, Which previous year was twenty six thousand four hundred. This year three thousand. So the difference there is thirty seven hundred bucks for three. Right. Bucks. So it's not. It's not like it didn't exist in the previous year. The difference between the two years, and correct me if I'm wrong, is about thirty seven hundred dollars. Right. So, yeah. So it's not that that didn't exist in the previous year. Right. I just want to make sure that that it's it's not that you went for that thirty thousand dollar increase was found within the trust fund. The trust fund already was contributing to the budget in twenty twenty one at a, at a rate of twenty six three sixty five. This year proposed thirty thousand question mark seems to be partially can the fund afford thirty thousand? It sounds like it can. It sounds like it follows the rule book similar to what we do for. Tax stabilization, um, but to your point, current year taxes is it a increase in the raising of taxes from four thirty eight to four eighty five, if I'm correct. Right, ten point seven two percent. I mean, I remember last year. Yeah, I remember what happened last year, and they ended up taking additional money from from their uh, from their fund to. Because we weren't, if I remember correctly, we weren't able to give them what they asked for last year. Is that well, we went right? we went from fourteen thousand two fifty five in two thousand twenty to twenty six thousand, so <coughs> almost double. But that was done uh, because we wanted to try to knock the tax rate down 
uh, last year. We didn't know what, where we were going to be, and we, we were trying to have that tax rate be lowered last year. Um, the, the trust money is the public's money. It needs to be used for the benefit of the library. And I think, you know, taking out 5% or something like that, is it, I don't have, Christine, am I right? Is the trust fund 600,000 or is it, well, is it less than that? I can't remember. Uh, it would take me a minute to pull up the exact current number, but it's, it's um, I believe it was around five, close to six, but not quite six last time I looked. I can get it. So I'm not, maybe I misunderstood what you were trying to ask, Chris. So I, are you just asking questions or do you have a recommendation to change something? No, because I think last year, like like I just soon see this year that, you know, we've gotten the budget proposal, you know, given to us and we'll have to put it into the mix of the rest of it and figure out how it's all going to sugar out. But I'm just trying to get an understanding that it, I guess I misunderstood the, I thought that the 30,000 was uh, an additional take from that fund to try to satisfy the, no. help satisfy the increase. Uh, it's it's a, a so, small increase. Yeah, Are you yeah. talking about the Morgan Stanley bill? Yeah. Do you want to go look at that? Yeah. Now, one other curveball, I guess I'll ask or talk about is I, at the last meeting, I believe I did mention something about uh, increasing the, uh, the maintenance fund for this for this building and other buildings but you know specifically we had a fund here we've eaten that up um, what can we do about putting a lump in there that we can build on um, I mentioned fifty thousand uh, dollars that come into your grand scheme well as you were working this out or yeah, so I can pass this out. Bill, the, um, the MDOF, yeah. is that supposed to be representative of only annual maintenance or is there also no, a no. CIP component to that? No, there's no CIP. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the uh, the Morgan Stanley portfolio is at the end of December uh, almost six hundred forty thousand dollars six six thirty seven seven ninety one. So this MBOF, which is fund seventy six, that's this is where we uh, pay for the operation and maintenance of this building. And the two main revenue sources are the library and the general fund. You can see 169,000 from the general fund and 194,000 from the library fund. And you know that those two revenues together end up paying for the maintenance of this building and the and the debt service on, on this building. And if you can see, Chris, that new equipment line item. On the uh, mm -hmm. expenses, where it was twenty thousand last year, and we didn't spend anything. But if you look above that, a couple of lines, you see building maintenance. We budgeted thirty-seven, but we spent fifty. So putting the twenty in the new equipment fund in this particular fund, if everything had worked out all right last year, we would start to build a fund balance in this fund to be able to be used for the building. <laughs> So we started 2021 with a negative fund balance of $16,000, $16,600. And I was hoping that we would end 2021 at $369 in the black and then keep doing that. And, and over a period of three or four years, you'd be up to $50,000 or so. You're always gonna have something that happens. But unfortunately, that first year that we tried to put that money aside, uh, we spent more in the heating plant of this building. And uh, knock on wood or whatever this is, um, you know, I think 
for right now, we've got all these systems fixed. Now, whether they'll break tomorrow or not, I don't know. So I am trying to get money into this fund, Chris, but I think putting it all in there all at once, it's going to come from tax money to do that. And if you don't want to have the taxes go up too much all at once, you have to do it incrementally. Yeah. Now, there's other things that we'll talk about. We've got, as I told you at the first meeting in January and alluded to a little bit last week, there's, there's some means by which we might infuse some cash into these into these budgets, but I want to talk about that later um, because these are operating budgets and departmental budgets that we have to get through. But with the with the ARPA money that's available, we have some we have some options to us that I think can be considered. But it's not time to talk about them right now. So. Just so you know, I, I mean, you probably saw it, but I signed a five thousand uh, dollar bill for yeah, and it's that. in that fifty thousand. Must have just occurred, you know, problem just occurred a couple of weeks ago. So there's five thousand. No, out. no, no. The five thousand that bill is already in that fifty thousand two eighty one. Oh, it's it is from last year. I've okay. already adjusted okay. the budget to take care of it. My bad. No, no, it's a reasonable point. I'm just telling you that. Well, I, I, yeah, and I guess my point was, it's you know, there's still issues that are coming up that are that are eating at you know eating at our pocketbook. So that went in the building maintenance yeah. line. So my fear is, you know, I, I remember back when the whole building process took place, and we talked about a 20-year bond versus a 30-year bond, and my concern was that, you know, in it, you you made the comment that people 30 years from now be paid should be helped pay for this building and i made the comment that yes they will be in fact having to replace windows having to replace heat system having to replace the roof having to replace yada yada so they're going to have their share of that uh, that we you know for the most part don't have right now uh so that's why i, I think we, my from my perspective why i wanted to shorten the bond to 20 years as versus as 30 years is to try to, you know, look ahead to save those people that are be dealing with this building that money anyway, you know, because they're going to have other things on their hands to deal with, probably new parking lot paving and many other things. So, uh, so my concern to want to build on this sooner than later is because how long have we been here now? Five years, six years, five years. Yeah, six. No, yeah, it's the clock's ticking on that. On that, you know. Okay, and we're on. keeping up with things. I mean, there's no, things that are going to go wrong, but we we spend money. We we maintain the building. We're not like just leaving it go to pop. I mean, I'm right now. My house that I'm living in is 25, 26 years old, and I'm <laughs> having to literally rebuild it again. And uh, you know, so it's just a fact. Uh, and it's. And I guess I'm just trying to prepare. I understand. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I guess yeah. what I'm asking, if you want to put, I've, I've got well, that line item that's got zero in there as a, you know, hoping that we're going to spend zero. So if you want more than that right now, then the taxes for the town and the library will, will have to go up. Right. This, that, that conversation will come when we get towards the end of this. That's it. I have a question. This is maybe my naivete. Um, you mentioned the part timers. Are they fully vested in terms of do they get health insurance? Do they get pay into the retirement system, et cetera? Um, I don't think no. that any of our part time. So I didn't think so. So, right. well, anybody who works 24 hours a week or more on a permanent basis, uh, they're part of the retirement system. Okay. If you work 30 hours a week or more, you're eligible for health insurance. Now, most of the library staff don't take health insurance. We have okay. at least three, maybe four eligible, and only one takes it. So if if everybody had a change of heart, you know, the budget could go up a hundred thousand dollars like that. Uh, so uh, but if you if you're scheduled to work 22 hours a week then what you get is your 
your hourly wage and you get sick time and you get vacation time. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions from the board? I have one question. I guess um, you know we we look at uh, we were able to grow a rec program through um, you know bringing in more programs, but they also increase revenues. Is there anything from a library standpoint, in your opinion, that obviously COVID creates some additional um, difficulties surrounding the program? But is there a revenue opportunity there that? Be considered a little set. Yeah, and there is one grant right now actually that was uh, the Vermont Children's Trust Foundation grant. So that's allowing us to bring in some higher ticket uh, program presenters than we would normally be able to do. That's generally what's available to us when it comes to program and grant money is it, it brings in a, it can bring in a short term you know, presenter and do a few a couple of series of programs. So last year we had one from the American Library Association that allowed us to bring in the poet Rodney Evans. Uh, for a fantastic, very powerful program. Um, it also allowed us to have a, uh, uh, a, a panel discussion by a uh, group of refugees in the area. So, mm -hmm. so we are always looking for options like that, uh, but they tend to, they tend to be one-time single purpose funding. So they're great for adding to what we already have for a base of programming. But they aren't, you know, we have to keep going back and, and applying again, getting more funds and, and targeting what we're looking for in a given year. So that's, but that's definitely always on my radar to be looking forward to increase our programming. Well, you don't charge no, user fees. Yeah, of course, oh, no, surrounding like, yeah. Yeah. you know, we've been able to find a nice balance of growing our rec program through fees that don't increase costs. But I didn't know if, like, I don't know, obviously the library. You want to make sure that the town has it's accessible through as much of it as possible. But are there ways to increase any kind of? There's more of a discussion mark surrounding revenues, and is there a way to increase revenues? I mean, obviously, like from here, it's there's not a lot of revenue other than um, people from other towns. But are there, you know, are there other revenue opportunities that should be considered? I I don't know the library well enough to even know whether that the answer. Is. Absolutely not. Or well, traditionally, some libraries charge fines for over books, and that's the revenue stream. But we actually chose to not do that uh, a few years back in an effort to be more equitable and make the materials more accessible to people without without that barrier. So, um, but it's a good question and something that we can certainly yeah. think about. Mm -hmm. Going along with Mark's kind of question, I know some groups, some libraries have like a friends of. You know, the water, say they have friends of the Water Bay Library, and you could then run some sort of a fundraiser kind of dinner option or something. I know right now it's a very difficult time to do those things because of COVID, but maybe looking at let's hope that by this year, yeah, this year we're out of COVID and things are a little normal. Yeah. You know, maybe something like that could be something that the library could consider. Yeah, we have a very active friends group. Um, they are just wrapping up their annual review from last year. They, they did very well there. They fund primarily things like a lot of our digital resources. We were just chatting before the meeting about um, More some of those better things. Yeah. So again, it tends to be some targeted items. Um, it's fantastic though, because it does allow us to experiment a little bit and try some new resources. See how see how the public takes to them and decide if this is something that's worth building into the budget going forward or not. So, uh, but they're 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 hoping to host a larger fundraising event this this late spring early summer, depending on how things are going yeah. and if they can have an in person event. So, Mike, the other the other challenge, and if you look at the revenue at the top of the page where it says revenue about yep. a little more than halfway down, it says donations. Yep. You see eleven thousand three hundred and twenty-seven, almost three hundred and twenty-eight dollars of donations yep. were made. But if you look down at the bottom of the expense side, you'll see purchased by donations, mm -hmm. which is the same number. And and okay. when people donate to the library, they're generally donating to get something more, not just to you know kind of contribute just for their operating. Their, to the you know to reduce the taxes right that, that get a, make a get donation a to, some to see something more happen so what we do and you don't see it here but um, probably in 2021 probably the library 
director, and that would be uh, all me, and then now Rachel, uh, of that $11,327. So it was probably eight or nine thousand dollars that was actually spent to buy something in 2021. And at the end of the year, there was still about three thousand dollars left. And that three thousand dollars was transferred out into fund 14, which is a, a, a second reserve fund that the library has. So the I think you know challenging or talking with the commissioners about how that fund 14, which we don't have here, we the trust fund is fund 16, that six hundred thousand dollars plus, and that funds that fine. But they do have another um, reserve fund, if you will, that is filled mostly with donations. And maybe some of that money could be spent at some point to help uh, you know, offset some things here. I've always thought it was best to show all the spending, however, in the operating budget, because the public really should know that it takes this much money to run a good library. If you if you're doing spending over here off on the side and people never see it, um, then they think that they're getting what they're getting for too low of a price. So if that fund 14 money is going to be spent, what I would suggest happens is that there'd be another transfer into the operating fund and then that additional spending would, would get shown. But they, they, they do have the friends, uh, they did a great job of fundraising when this building was being built. And they, they had extra money left over. They used that uh, to to do a number of things in the library uh, that you know wasn't paid for by taxpayers, and and they still have some of that money left. So, any other questions for Rachel this year? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I would ask you, though, if you could make a motion to uh, say that the tax levy for the library will be uh, no greater than 485. 557, but that's the, the, if you're going to make it lower, if you don't want those tax, if you don't want that tax levy of 485, 557, 575, the commissioners either have to cut the budget or come up with some more money somehow. So I'd like that. Is that a specific challenge just because the library has it a separate commission versus because we have the <coughs> yeah, the, the state law with regard to libraries. Uh, says that public libraries, uh, even if they're municipal, are operated by the elected commissioners. They are the trustees of the library. The library staff is the only staff in the whole town that I don't get to appoint. So the commissioners hired Rachel. Uh, the town manager doesn't have any control over any of the library staff. Uh, the commissioners are the trustees of the library trust fund. Uh, they make decisions about how that's invested and how much they want to use to contribute to the to the library. The law says that the select board can tell the library commissioners how much taxes they can have to use for the library. Uh, once you make that appropriation, I mean, the public can change it. If you had open town meeting, they could make a motion to reduce the, the tax level. If you have uh, Australian ballot, they can just vote no. But um, if the uh, select board, the select board can tell the commissioners how much the tax levy is. And, and at that point, they can do whatever they want with that money. You don't have the ability to go in there and say, well, we don't want you to spend $29,000 on books, make it $20,000. Can't do that. You, all you have control over is the is the taxes. So the, the request is that we do a motion that says that the town will, as we go through a budgeting process, will not allocate less than 485,575. Yeah. Um, unless the unless the taxes are lowered by some other means, not through the trust fund. 
less or more, more right? 40, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It won't be more than 45,575. No, I, I'm i asking you not to make it less than oh. that because that's what, if you make it less, if you cut that to, to 460, you have to cut the then they either have to cut the budget or they got to add trust money. Right. So 485,575. Unless the select board finds another one, so don't bother making a motion. But can can we at least wait until the end of the night? Well, that's what we did last year. Yeah, we wait until the end. And so, with it. well, I'm just trying to right. help right. the library commissioners because if you don't, unless you're going to come up with money from some other source, uh, if you decide to lower that, I just don't want the commissioners to have to cut the budget or to raise the, the trust fund. If you come up with other money to infuse in there, that's okay with me if you want to reduce the taxes that way. But to be fair to them, their budget is 548.45. So um, I just want them to be able to call a special meeting if they have to. So. Can we just wait until the end of this evening when yeah. we, we, we hear the highway planning and stuff like that? I think that would be, it, you know, until we kind of see what's okay. there. Okay. And, and then we could, I, I have no problem with it, making a motion. All right. Okay. Planning department budget. Okay. Do you want to wait until Danny comes back? Yeah. Okay. Could have been one even no greater, no less than. No less. No less. Oh. How is our search for? Oh, <laughs> the million dollar question. <laughs> Very difficult. <laughs> yeah, the last person that you appointed, Eric Lucson. Uh, stay with his current employer with campaign for a different job. Yeah, I yeah. yeah, so um, we're, we're planning on uh, advertising again this week, okay. and then the planning commission would do interviews at their first meeting in February. So that's the current plan. Yeah, so we're just happy. so their first meeting is the second week of February. It is, yes. That's so, the uh, well, it's like the 14th, yeah, 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 just like second. Year. Okay. Steve, would you ever consider reaching out to their municipality and you know, seeing if their person would be interested in coming over to our side? And well, <laughs> that's a really awkward uh, thing People to do. do. It's like yeah. the NFL. Well, the, the, the middle person that you appointed. Um, was the zoning minister for town of Richmond and he responded and he has since left Richmond for a different job. He did? He did. Uh, yeah. There you go. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I haven't inquired, but luckily they have an intern who's doing zoning minister. But anyway, they're just asking about the search and the, the difficult. So, anyway, the employment these days. So, the, yeah. the the planning budget is before you. Um, I sent along the justification page that Steve had given to me, and I put a note in there in my memo that Steve's justification was done prior to um, you know the ask from RW and Karen Evans. So what I've done is for the 22 budget, I have included the entire ask that our W made. So $32,600 down on that bottom line would have was 17 last year. They asked it to go to 23. And then they asked for $9,600 of beautification money. So I put that whole ask on the revitalizing Waterbury line because Karen and Steve and I had talked and last year was five thousand dollars. Some of that money was always, um, some of it was spent in collaboration with RW. So everything that RW is going to have anything to do with, I've put in that bottom line thirty-two thousand six hundred. So that is their entire ask. 
I did drop Steve's beautification line from 5,000 to 2,000 because, uh, I mean, to 3,000 because that, that $2,000 I thought uh, was overlap. So uh, it's, it's not a, it's not a drop of $5,000. It's because there's some things that we do with beautification. That so that's what net, because that's what I was really confused looking because I remember that $9,600 number from RW. Yeah. So that's what's netting out the, the whole $9, thing. $9,600 is in the 32.6 at the very, at the bottom of the budget. Yep. You see that? Yep. So that's 23,000 for their, their regular um, general operating budget plus the $9,600 of okay. so that's beautification. Where... And I dropped our own beautification line item by $2,000. Now there's things in that beautification line of our own that like the uh, Newton Baker Park up on Stowe Street, the Newton Baker Little Park. RW doesn't do anything with that park. That's something that we have to deal with ourselves. And that's in Steve's $3,000. So with that, I'll stop. I'll let Steve uh, kind of go through everything else. I, I think I was pretty clear about the knowing the administrators pay. It's, uh, it's about a $50,000 annual pay is what we propose for that, uh, about $24 an hour. But because the person won't be coming on until 10 weeks into the year, it's going to be a little bit uh, lower. So anyway, with that, I'll let Steve go from there and then we can answer questions. Okay, that sounds good. So what I'd like to do is just um, hit the highlights in the budget and then give a chance for you to ask questions. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, the planning department work plan for uh, 2022. Um, I didn't uh, have time to do an update to my work plan that I normally do, but I, I'd like to give you some, some highlights on that. So um, Bill also talked about the legal line. And um, so maybe we'll, um, well, let's, let's start from the top of the non, what, what I say, uh, what I call non-pay uh, related items. So professional service, um, we're still working on updating the um, nomination for this new historic district for our uh, additional historic district. So that money is still in there. That project didn't um, get finished this year. So we're, we're planning on having the consultants finish that um, in 2022. Uh, they're currently working on the stone shed pro pro project. So my hope is that that'll be an angle we can work with them to get that project wrapped up we did pay for some of it oh we did we did there's only about fourteen hundred dollars left in the contract so the bulk of the work is done we're just trying to get it finished okay um the uh, green mountain byway project is the five hundred dollars uh this is the six town byway it was just waterbury and so the waterbury conservation commission i think maybe when you were on the commission yeah. mike uh, initiated this project uh we now um, brought in the four Lamont County um, towns from uh, Morristown over to Cambridge. And um, that's really a marketing uh, group, a very uh, dynamic group, I think, that uh, Revalis and Waterbury is involved with. Uh, Laura Pratt is our secretary. So um, I think that's uh, been a real fruitful collaboration. Uh, so is um, their new planning director, Sarah McShane who lives in Waterbury is uh, actively involved as well. Is Laura Waterbury's representative to the Byway Committee? Uh, she is one of the committee members, okay. correct. And then I'm, I'm involved, and then there are a couple other people who are on the uh, email list, but uh, Laura and I, Mike Hedges is still involved. So there are a number of Waterbury people who are very interested in the project. So um, the legal services line, um, we've been, uh, been involved in um, enforcement issue on uh, Moody Court that's been resolved. That involves some expense, attorney expense, because it had to go to court. That's been resolved. Uh, we have an appeal up by the Hunter Mountain Trailhead of a, a subdivision there that's ongoing. Um, with Glenn Anderson, the neighbor. Um, so that's ongoing. We're gonna have some additional expense in monitoring that. We're not 
litigating ourselves. It's really between the landowner who uh, permitted the three lot subdivision and the neighbor. But the town, uh, we always try to defend our decisions, the decisions that the Development Review Board makes. That involves attorney time, monitoring things. And uh, we have some ideas of um, maybe a way to help settle that. We don't know if that will work or not. So we'll have some ongoing involvement. In that um, we we just find in this in this day and age that um, we're pretty actively seeking legal advice. It really helps when we work with things. To, um, a good example was this uh, Act 250 ordinance where we need some legal help writing the notice. Uh, it just works much better to be proactive. Um, I don't tend to ask for a lot of day to day advice, uh, Dina. Uh, was much more um, willing to pick up the phone if she had a question. Um, so I don't tend to do that, but we do have uh, special circumstances. Uh, the Unified Development Bylaw uh, will we'll be needing some legal help along the way with that. So the, the wild card is really, you know, the enforcements or or appeals of decisions. Correct. And the the one the, you know the Grayson appeal up on Sweet Road. Um, unfortunately. Um, it may have changed now, but the the uh, the person who appealed was representing himself, which ends up costing all the other parties a lot more money because the judges bend over backwards to try to help somebody who's pro se, and you know motions are a lot longer, and you know emails and everything else that have to be read. So it's it's a it's a challenge. So. Yeah, we're hoping he's going to hire attorney. There's been some discussion that he proposed. But anyway, we'll see how that all goes. So um, Bill and I had some discussion, and uh, he's proposing a $10,000 line item, which is a little less than what's projected for this year. I think that uh, will hopefully be adequate. Uh, I think um, advertising expenses have, have gone up. We're, we try to use the Waterbury uh, reader um, for almost all of our notices. It's a, it's very reasonable. It gets into every mailbox and is widely circulated in Waterbury. But uh, we've been very active on the Development Review Board. Um, we've just in terms of permit activity and and uh, had to use had to do quite a bit of advertising. So that's showing some increase. Also, uh, for yeah. employment. Employment that. <clears throat> That is a huge chunk. Uh, we were advertising seven days at like 400 some dollars a, a notice. So we'll try to do things a little more reasonably this go round. But still, we're, we're really making an effort to get the word out in a whole variety of um, sources, uh, seeking minority um, applicants and, and so on. So, um, while you're talking yeah, about sure. that, you, but you think that this, I just lost the light on um, you think that that 2000, even knowing we'll be advertising for Bill's position, um, you think that will still be able to cover it? Maybe no, some adjustments? Bill's position. Oh, well, we don't do it. That's all through. The, the, the assistant planning. Not, in, not in the yeah. planning budget. You know, oh, I'm planning. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It's my brain. No, but yeah. we are advertising again. We're this, advertising again. This year. But you're going to make some system. changes for. Yeah, we're, we're, we are we probably won't yeah. advertise in seven days, but still it's an expense. Yeah. And I think it won't be quite as high as it was last year. So uh, as yeah, 2021 is the year to date, it's quite high. So um, Bill, uh, well, office supplies, somehow that got missed last year. Uh, so that should be 650. We do buy lots of paper, lots of other, uh, well, a lot of it is paper to be honest with you. But anyway, we're still a paper related uh, society. Uh, Bill talked about beautification. Uh, we assist uh, the uh, garden club, the River Runs Through It um, Garden Club, with the purchase of flowers every year for their projects. And uh, we're uh, doing some work on Newton Baker Park uh, now that the bridges have been reconstructed uh, to do some planting there, just make it a more appealing park so we can get. More utilization there. Uh, training and tuition, we're hoping will 
go back to some in person. I'm, uh, I will be traveling to Maine for a free state conference um, this fall. So um, we'll we'll see how that all goes. And um, once we bring on um, a new assistant, um, we'll build be some training there. We do provide funding for uh, development review board members, planning commission members, conservation commission members. If they want to do training, we uh, we offer to pay, and we do pay for those trainings, whether it's through Vermont Lake cities and towns. That's typically where where the uh, training expense is. Um, mapping uh, the planning department splits two different mapping expenses with um, the assessor's office. They are our tax maps are, um, that are both digital and in paper. So we have a consultant that um, does those. We put $1,200 in and then uh, the assessor's office puts $1,200 uh, in. And then our online parcel mapping system, we have a consultant cartographic associates that maintains that. Um, and that utilizes the parcel mapping, but it has other layers. It's, um, it's very actively used. We use it as staff. Um, we uh, encourage um, local property owners, uh, people in the real estate community, development community, and they do utilize it uh, well. So it's a great resource. And then there's some additional mapping that is done by the uh, Central Park Regional Planning Commission. So we've got an extra 400 in there, 1200 for each of the two different mapping systems and then 400 for the Regional Planning Commission. They do maps, for instance, for our unified development bylaws. We're developing new zoning maps. So those that get developed, uh, revisions are made and, and so on. Uh, the Regional Planning Commission dues um, have been going up each year. So that's the actual figure that we'll, we'll spend on our dues. We uh, get a lot of service out of from the Regional Planning Commission, transportation, advocacy for our projects. Um, and they work with Green Mountain Transit on transit planning. Um, and I mentioned the zoning assistance, they do 12 hours a year of uh, mapping uh, as part of that. So it's a good, um, I'm currently the chair of the Board of Commissioners and chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. We sort of rotated with two year terms as uh, chair of the board. So that's one of my last draws there. And, um, and it's a good, we have a very good leadership group and, and it's uh, strong with a representative from each of the I think 24 uh, towns that are in the Central Mount region. Uh, let's see. Uh, so from my economic development corp, um, you know, they support, um, for instance, uh, Ivy Computers has applied for a um, veggie grant, they call them, uh, to help they're looking to build an office building. So it was uh, a place the theater. It was awarded. It was awarded, yes. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Uh, so so the Central Mine Economic Development Corp supports local businesses with uh, funding for uh, business um, development. Uh, that, there's a good example with um, with Ivy Computers, one of our very successful local businesses, by the way. Um, so, uh, Let's see, dues or uh, different uh, association dues. Uh, travel, we're hoping to get back. There was very little travel. I traveled to one conference for two days, uh, but we're hoping to get back for some travel. And uh, once we hire an assistant a planning and zoning administrator, we're encourage them to get out in the community, do more enforcement, be more proactive. So we're anticipating more travel costs. I didn't spend $80 for the two trips. It was two trips to Burlington. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, <laughs> this year I'll drive to Maine for a, a three day conference. But uh, yeah, that's all it was. Not much with COVID. Yeah, not much driving around. And I don't charge. If I'm going to measure a driveway, I don't charge for that. So that's just part of the year. Okay. So the um, yeah, office equipment, we're in good shape there. Um, Conservation Commission, we do a $700 um, budget each year. Some years they have um, they've spent all of it, some years with COVID, and I think they're 
they're um, just not actively developing materials and things of that nature. So, so just so you know, Danny, that that seven hundred thousand, yeah, hundred, that seven hundred dollars <laughs> uh, gets transferred out of the planning budget, and it goes. We do have a conservation fund, and that seven hundred dollars goes into their fund, and then they, um, you know, they they last year they had a budget of about. Uh, I don't know, five or six hundred dollars. So the money so it's always going to show as spent. It's going to show as spent here, and it just moves it into the conservation fund, and then you know they have some other revenues and things. But they didn't do much in two thousand twenty-one mm -hmm. either because of COVID. So, but that's why that line item is always going to be one hundred percent because it just gets transferred. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, Bill talked to you about the uh, revitalizing the waterberry. And um, one of the, um, and I, this may be re reiterating what Karen talked to you about, but um, we're working with Michael Asciavo, who maintains our gardens here and maintains the roundabout to really uh, take over some of the activity that volunteers have been very involved with, putting up the garland, taking it down, uh, putting up the hanging baskets, uh, watering those, which he did last year. So I think it really is helpful. We're trying to kind of reduce the burnout level on volunteers. We've had a very, very active uh, volunteer cadre. Uh, you know, I'm going to be retiring a year from March. I've been very involved in, in the whole volunteer effort. So I think this is a really more sustainable approach. And, and so that um, those funds will help uh, revitalize Waterbury, pay for some uh, contractor support for these beautification projects. That, uh, the value of the volunteer effort that we've had has been huge. So we're kind of transferring some of that dollar value from a volunteer. Uh, yeah, we'll still have volunteers. Oh, yeah, we're just not going to yeah. do the things required to get up on ladders. Right, some of the riskier stuff. stuff like that. Right. Um, you can see there that the budget is up $18,290. Uh, 15,600 of it is that line item right above that, uh, the, the appropriation to revitalize the water break. If you net out the savings in 2000, of $2,000 for beautification, the, that's you know uh, 13,600 of the 18,290. And then the difference, really the, the difference is the legal line. It went up from, went up $4,500. So, you add 4,500 to uh, to 13.6, you're going to be close to that 18.290. There's a few other little minor things, but it's it's essentially a level funded budget this year. Uh, that zoning administrator line isn't fully uh, funded though. So a year from now, the zoning administrator line will be over 50, assuming we hire someone. So I think I want to uh, like open it up to questions, and then I just got to comment on a few different uh, work plan items. But while this is fresh in your mind, I uh, want to see if anybody had any questions, comments. Then... Well, let me mention a few things and if you take some questions, that's that's fine. So um, in the work plan, um, there are just a couple things I wanted to highlight. We've had some discussion of the uh, rewrite of the zoning regulations, the so-called unified development bylaw. Uh, the planning commission is working on a first phase. It's going to be the whole geographic area between uh, Interstate 89 and the Winooski River. So it will include the whole core area of the village where we have a lot of our housing uh, stock, if you will, and a lot of our economic uh, development. It includes the uh, industrial area out route two. So uh, they're working hard on that, I think making some real good headway. So we'll have a draft hopefully within the next uh, six months or so for you to take a look at and keep you posted on that. Um, and then I um, want to talk about a couple other projects, the Emerald Ash Borer Management. Uh, we had a very successful grant. We took out 20 large ash trees that were in the 
uh, highway right of way and then process them into firewood that we sold for donations to the uh, Waterbury Behavior Fund and to the Rotary Club Charitable Fund. So that was all done with um, not the tree removal, Eric Potter did that, Potter's Tree Healthcare, but then the firewood project was all volunteer based with tree committee members and um, Rotary Club members. Uh, the tree committee's been very active. It's a very good group. Michael Schiavo has joined the tree committee, which is great. Um, and uh, so we have applied for the one grant that you're aware of that would be for tree planting um, on Railroad Street and up at Hope Davy Park. Uh, I think we've got a good chance of getting that. And then we may ask for a grant application that would go in in the fall, but probably not. Um, happen until next year. That would be some additional ash tree removal along in the uh, highway right away. So we're really trying to be proactive. We're also treating ash for emerald ash borer, some of the large chestnut trees. So that's been done through the through the highway uh, department of cemetery fund as, as well. Just a couple other things to highlight in the floodplain management program. Um, we our floodplain management working group has been uh, has really not been active um, just because of other priorities major reconstruction and so on but um, we're still very active with the um, community rating system the FEMA program that provides a uh, discount for the uh, property owners who pay flood insurance uh, back in May of 2020 uh, we renewed our our CRS uh, community rating system membership uh, uh, five years from our initial application and we went from a level nine to a level eight which is uh, a higher level and they go from nine to one one being the highest and that now provides 10 percent discount for those that pay flood insurance so it's a direct benefit to people in the community uh, we have a whole bunch of different programs relating to flood hazard regulations, uh, conservation of floodplain area, um, outreach to um, both the applicants, landowners, the real estate community, the banking community, to educate them about floodplain issues. So uh, just want to let you know, uh, um, my, by the end of this month, I have to uh, do the annual report. So that that will be happening and we'll make sure that gets taken care of to keep up that membership. Uh, we talked about the Green Mountain Byway and um, Colbyville bike head project is waiting on the bridge uh, work. Um, you probably hear about that uh, some point under highway or um, where that's in that bridge, which is well, the bridge on Stowe Street just before you get to Route 100 intersection um, is in the so called scoping phase that uh, VTrans is doing. We've done some coal borings. So we're hoping once that bridge is um, gotten the report, I know of the recommendation of the consultant. So that once the scoping is done, then it can go into design and construction, and then we can do the sidewalk project. <laughs> so that's all uh, those pieces are still. Uh, being put in place. So other than that, I think I know you've got more to do tonight. And uh, the final request, if anybody has any questions or comments. Just had a question on the <clears throat> ash trees. Uh, are they taking the mature ones not only because they're mature, but is there a higher risk that the more mature trees are Prone to the emerald ash war, or well, what we did is there been any sign of the yeah? Emerald we haven't ash. found any emerald ash war. So um, when Eric took down the tree, he didn't find any. Uh, so we've definitely been lucky, but um, we did an inventory that was wrapped up in um, well 2020, really, of all of our roadside ash of any size, you know, above you know four or six inches. And um, that's about, we inventory about 600 trees that are all in a digital inventory. It's available online. 
And we picked out um, 20 trees that were dead or were in fair or poor condition. Fair condition. So the idea was to target those that should come down. Part of the rationale is try to get ahead of the curve before emerald ash borer gets here. It's in Richmond, it's in Montpelier, it's you know, Barry Town, it's in much other towns in the problem. So um, so the idea is to be proactive. And then the other aspect is once an, an ash tree dries in, dies in, I think uh, you would know this as well as anybody, Chris, they get very brittle and they're more costly to take down. They're more dangerous just because you can get large falling limbs when they're tough. So the idea is to try to uh, remove the ones that are in poor condition before they really get out. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep, keep looking, keep your hands on. Okay, well, thanks. And, you know, I really appreciate all your support for our planning efforts. And we'll hope that we have better luck to go yeah. around with the candidates. So we'll, do we all do. we'll see us uh, back here. With, hopefully, with the okay, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Moving on, highway. In the fact that you didn't see the CIP budget. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. Highway. Highway. So Celia's not going to be with us tonight, uh, given the weather outside. They've been all day. So here I am. Um, <laughs> As I indicated in the memo, their spending is up uh, 6.3 percent from last year. Uh, taxes up uh, 8.6 percent, 8.7 percent. If the transfer to the capital fund stayed the same, uh, that would drop the, the tax rate by uh, a couple of percentage points. Um, it's pretty much a level funded budget. Uh, the, the pay lines are up. I we addressed that last year, and I told you, you know, we made some incremental changes in 2021, and uh, I'm, I'm budgeting for uh, some additional pay raises uh, for. Um, Municipal staff around the three percent level, um, and that's reflected here in, in this budget. So the four hundred nine thousand um, is a little decline in health insurance because uh, one less person took it, and there's been some other changes in terms of the plans that they take. Um, the Lines that are significantly different really are kind of right in the middle of the page. The equipment maintenance line, which was $33,000 in 2021, mm -hmm. uh, and we spent uh, about that, we spent 32000 I say this every year, but there's going to be bills come in. The, these actual numbers are going to change a little bit but uh, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. Uh, if they get, if they come in and change between now and the time that we're finished with the budget, I'll, I'll update the numbers. And I've already added some things that I know that are coming down the pipe where I already know the expenses there. But that equipment maintenance line, uh, although we spent right about what we plan to spend this year, it's up significantly, it goes to $49,000 for next year. And um, Celia included, uh, I sent to you the, this sheet of Celia's. And the reason why the, the, the jump is so big, is partly because of uh, the cost of parts and labor, uh, Chris, 
was talking about it just before the meeting started, the supply chain issues and everything else that we know about. But it also just happens that every year uh, there are certain vehicles that require a little bit more um, um, in terms of regular schedule. You know, it's they hit the whatever number of hours or the number of miles. And it's just that in 2022, we have more of them, more of the pieces of equipment have uh, those higher asks this year. So I'm hoping that might be a long item that would go down maybe a little bit next year. Uh, but that's that's probably the, the line that has the biggest real variance in it. <clears throat> I mean, between, oh. excuse me, Bill, between the two equipment maintenance and vehicle maintenance, your 21,000 increase just those two items. Right. And, and I was, I was going to move down to the vehicle maintenance next. Um, same, same kind of thing. Um, I think Celia actually. Yeah, Celia had asked for 30, um, and I bumped it up to 35, uh, just based on kind of, um, well, we had one truck at the end of 21 that had some problem, and I'm not sure if it's fully some of the issues that it was in for will be posted to the 21 year and then there's probably some things that are going to be for 2022 so i bumped that up five thousand dollars from what she asked um just because i, I think that that one particular truck is going to have some some expense that wasn't included in her budget the other line item that is up uh, is the public works director line that went from 32,000 to 42,000. Uh, and that's just a function of the amount of hours that Bill Woodruff and Alec Custody work. They, uh, they provide me a spreadsheet at the end of the year. Um, and they, you know, the total number of hours. So Bill Woodruff is a salaried employee. So it's 2,080 hours. And then he tells me how many hours he worked in the various departments. So that I just multiply those hours by paying a benefit rate. And then uh, what we do is we charge it back. So the cost in 2022 really is to, to compensate for what you did in 2021, because there's no way at the beginning of the year that you're going to know exactly how much you're going to work. Um, I think that line item will likely go down uh, Main Street, um, even though we were at the end of the project, there was a lot of administrative stuff with Main Street, there was a lot of inspections. So we spent uh, more time uh, on Main Street than, than we had in the prior year. So anyway, um, I think those are the three <laughs> line items that I know that are significantly up from last year. And then, of course, the bottom line there, the two capital fund line, uh, I've increased it uh, by 5%, uh, but it's uh, what about $30,000 increase uh, from what it was last year. That's just to fund the CIPs. I think that. Uh, if we can do that and still keep our tax rate reasonable, it's good to make those transfers to try to get ahead of future future needs, as we've talked about in the past. Um, I did pass along with the um, you know, this list, kind of the detailed line item list for the end of that. Um, right after her CIP replacement schedule. She's listed the, the jobs that she hopes to do in 2021. Uh, notice uh, that uh, even though it's a class four road and uh, 
uh, we're going to try to do some work on Ring Road this year. We've had lots of requests there the last couple of years, and uh, you know we're not going to be able to make it perfect. It's a class four, very narrow, tough place to work, but try to do some work in the ditching and the ditch lines, and then uh, you know try to. Do some erosion control in the ditches with that stone and the hydro seeding. Um, there's several culvert replacements, uh, one of those on Ring Road as well. Uh, <clears throat> Danny, just again, since this is your first budget, um, and at the last meeting did they do the highway plastic? The, Highway mileage certification. So when you sign that mileage mm -hmm. certification, well, you might not have been here. Yeah. Um, so uh, the town, the town is responsible to fully maintain class one, two, and three town highways. Uh, those are most of our roads, Main Street to class one highway, uh, Stowe Street to class two highway, which indicates it's a collector highway, and then most of our other roads like um, you know, in Flats Road or Ring Road, uh, not Ring Road, uh, Ripley Road or Maple Street. Those are, uh, well, Maple Street's a little bit of a collector. But anyway, those are class three roads. We were responsible to do maintenance on those roads uh, all year round. Class four roads, uh, we don't provide any winter maintenance on class four roads. And we don't have to do anything to the roads except keep them passable. Um, it used to be that uh, they referred to a 1967 reclassification by the legislature. Um, and uh, that's where the that passable comes from. But we're required to maintain the water courses on those roads, and we're required to make sure the road still exists. Uh, class four roads, Woodard Hill Road, which is off of Little River Road. Uh, Ring Road is a class four road. Uh, Middlesex Notch Road is a class four road. Part of Maggie's Way is a class four road. And there's a couple of others that I'm probably not remembering. Uh, we typically don't do much on those roads. Um, but because we have to uh, make sure the roads exist so people can get to where they want to go. And more and more people have started building on class four roads. It used to, when I first came here, you know, almost everything on class four road was a can, you know. Now we have lots of houses, uh, expensive houses on class four roads. Um, so, if we have a big rainstorm and the road washes out, which has happened on Wooded Hill Road a lot more often than really any other class four road that we have, uh, we got to spend a lot of money to put it back. So we do from time to time some work on these class four roads to try to um, alleviate those damages uh, or try to make sure they don't happen. So anyway, um, that's her. Uh, this list is the projects that will be funded through the operating budget. Um, I do want you to take note of the uh, little uh, five or six paragraph explanation at the end. Um, we have had a terrible time. We weren't able to, to paint any center lines last year uh, because we can't buy the paint. Um, not that we don't want to do it, we just, there was no paint available. And as you can see there, um, <clears throat> paint is uh, very expensive. Uh, culverts, the cost of culverts have gone up. Uh, and these supply chain issues that we have, both in terms of just getting the material and, and price increases are, are a reality right now. So anyway, uh, that's really all I have to say at the moment. You can fire away at me with your question. <clears throat> um, I'm surprised I didn't see a, an increase in the salt 
line item at all. Uh, I've been watching when I'm signing orders for an increase there. I haven't seen it yet. Still seventy one dollars a ton. Um, I'm not sure how long that'll last, but uh, I'm surprised the supply chain issues haven't impacted that as well. Well, we're also trying to use less. I'm not saying we are using less, but we're making an effort. Um, am I correct in seeing that she's looking to buy a Harley rate and a roller? Sometimes well, that's in the CIP budget. Yes. Okay, so that's where I saw that. We'll get to that. Yeah. Go ahead. No, uh, everything. Um, grounds maintenance, that's, I won't say it's down, but it's not up from last year. It was budgeted at 6,000. We only spent two grand. Yeah. Uh, half of that's down so much. Um, not that I'm complaining, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that myself. Uh, and I, um, I saw that myself and I forgot to ask for a, why we didn't spend it since we asked for it last year. And maybe that was just a mistake. Grounds maintenance. Uh, yep. Uh, I don't have an explanation. She did note that she asked for six last year, but was only asking for three this year. So I'll leave it. A lot of that probably got shifted into the um, the budget for this building. Mm -hmm. So the ground, Celia used to put money, if, if you look on this page on here where she's got her note about grounds maintenance, you'll see it says uh, roundabout maintenance, $2,000, launch $1,000, and then roundabout municipal complex and garden club, and there's no dollar numbers next to those. She used to put in her budget the money to maintain the grounds of this property. And I, a couple of years ago, maybe it was at the beginning of last year, told her that, no, that's in Fund 76, the, the uh, municipal building operator fund. So um, we, we do pay for that here at this building, but not part of the highway budget. Yeah, I guess, yeah. uh, no real questions. Can you remind me what highway labor materials or revenue? That yeah, so, so uh, we have, we don't have dedicated crews for everything. So when, when the, uh, if they need work done on the roads and the cemeteries, Okay. The highway crew does the work. We use gravel and things and put it there. Oh, so it's just and the cemetery money. fund pays the highway fund back. That's okay. All. And it's the same. It's kind of like that pool cross charge line. So yeah, you know the highway crew helps get the pool ready at the beginning of the year. They wash it down, do whatever little maintenance, and you know the, so the pool budget pays for that. So it's just. It goes from one municipal pocket to the other. Yeah. That's all. It's just fun to put in a, it's fun to count. That's okay. all. <laughs> Other questions. Let me get asked. I noticed she, she said in her comments about the street signs, the lumber tree. Do we change that many street signs a year? No, it's just, I think that's just a comment. We, we don't right. change them, but every once in a while, we, we right, something gets knocked over or something like that. You know, it, fortunately, it, fortunately, it was, I don't know, it was probably five years ago where the, I never get it right, the MVP, the, the, the standard for the signs. Yeah. Uh, the state changed the standard and they wanted all the signs with higher reflectability. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad it happened five years ago. <laughs> it would cost a fortune. Exactly. But, no, we only change them like when some teenage kids, the old vandalizes or puts them up on their bedroom wall. 
It was me as a kid. <laughs> so we're all set on the highway budget? Okay. Um, the CIP budgets, and here, Chris, uh, so let's, on the first page, and I didn't write any uh, elaborate memos for the CIP, because it's still, frankly, uh, a little bit of a work in progress, and I thought it was fairly self-explanatory. So uh, in Celia's budget, she did include uh, her CIP items for uh, fund 70, and that's paid in uh, fund 71, which is infrastructure and then uh, vehicles. So let's just start with paving since that's the first one. Um, we, we were awarded a $175,000 grant in 2021 by the state of Vermont, um, but the award came so late in the year that it was gonna be difficult. We, we didn't know we were gonna get the money mm -hmm. before we really had to move out and do some uh, scheduling of paving projects. So even though we had thought about uh, paving Stowe Street last year, um, the grant came too late. So we did Blush Hill instead. The costs on Blush Hill uh, for the paving for the, uh, the 382, 991, most of that was Blush Hill and, and Lonesome Trail. Um, the 38,609 was paving from the Main Street intersection over the dry bridge on Stowe Street. Um, so the $175,000 grant that was awarded is still in place. We had, uh, I think, 24 months to spend it. So we will do Snow Street in 2022. So that, that $175,000 is not a question mark. That is a we got it. Yes, we, yeah. we've got that right. So, um, and then the... Uh, The highway fund, I'm proposing to transfer 325-420 into the uh, paving fund uh, from that highway uh, $614,000 line. Uh, pilot, uh, I'm going to budget for the full pilot amount that we've got this year. I'm hoping that we don't get burned, uh, but I've got a couple hundred thousand dollars or more going into the general fund and then I'm Proposing to split the hundred thousand uh, into three CIP funds: the paving fund, uh, the uh, I think the uh, infrastructure, uh, the highway vehicle fund, and the recreation fund. So anyway. Um, Paving for 2022, we're proposing to do Stowe Street, we'll use the grant, and then uh, Hill Street, North Street, and Swayze Court, all of which are in the neighborhood of Stowe Street. Swayze Court and North Street are side streets right off of Stowe Street. Swayze Court's right across from the school. North Street's the little um, half moon loop at the top of Stowe Street. Hill Street, I don't know how often you drive over there, but Hill Street is probably the worst street that we have in town right now. Uh, it needs to be done. Um, so those are the proposals for uh, paving this year. Um, I'm gonna just kind of go through this and then we can, we can come back. Um, and then you know there's fifty thousand, fifty-five thousand dollars worth of debt still to go on the Perry Hill uh, note or bond that we have that runs through twenty twenty-six, I think. Um, maybe twenty twenty-four. I didn't bring the uh, debt management budget with me, but it's got a couple more years left. In the infrastructure fund. Um, that state grant that's highlighted in blue, 
and the downtown projects that's also highlighted in blue at $240,000. That is money that Karen Nevin spoke about last week. If you remember, she talked about the state um, amping up its uh, grant program for downtowns. Um, the maximum grant you can get is $200,000 and um, the, the, the match for $200,000 grant is $40,000. So you have to, to get a full grant of $200,000, you have to have a project of $240,000. So uh, I'm gonna be meeting with Karen and Steve later this week. Uh, she's gonna talk about what she wants to do with that. Um, it really doesn't impact our budget too much because if we don't get the grant, we won't do the project. And if we get a lesser grant, if it's a hundred thousand dollars instead of two hundred, we'll have a twenty thousand dollar match instead of a forty thousand dollar match. So right now, the money is in the expense side at two forty to simply maximize the. The, the grant that we could get. I, I don't have a project that I can tell you tonight. Uh, next Monday, I'll be able to tell you what the proposal is that they want to submit. I think the grant application is due in March. So then there's $184,000, 200, 184, 200 transfer in from the highway fund into the infrastructure fund. The projects that I and we, Bill Woodruff and Celia and I all talked about um, $113,000 worth of sidewalks. Uh, that's Randall Street. If you walk on Randall Street, the sidewalks on both sides of the street are horrible. Um, we've, done, we've done a significant upgrades of sidewalks in the past couple of years. We did a sidewalk on North Main Street uh, two, three years ago, we did um, sidewalk on the west side of Winooski Street in 2020. 2020. We did the, the east side of Winooski Street in 2021. Uh, Randall Street. So I've got 113 in there right now. If when we get to the end, if we have to, that could be cut in half and we do one side this year, one side next year, um, like we did on Winooski Street, if we can't afford to do this. But for right now, if we can get both of those done, it would be a, a, a good idea. Um, the culvert for $62,000, that's the large culvert on Flush Hill Road that we didn't finish the paving project. We, had, we were gonna leave the whole road not paid last year, but uh, we ended up putting the base course on, but we didn't pay, the, we didn't do anything in the vicinity of that culvert. So um, we've got $62,000 for that, for that job. Um, I'm surprised it's as cheap as, as it is. Uh, we had to get a hydraulic study done by the state. I don't have with me the size of the pipe that it needs to be. Because uh, the pipe isn't gonna be so necessarily so huge, but it's a, it's a deep, the brook is deep compared to the, uh, where the, the road surface is, you know, where the grade of the road. So we've got to do that project uh, this year because we've got to finish that uh, particular, particular line item. The building improvements, uh, $45,000. You can see those on the on Celia's list. Uh, siding on the highway garage, uh, some siding replacement, uh, and some painting on the greater barn. Uh, <coughs> finish replacing the lights in the greater barn. And then there's a more grade in the highway garage that. Um, Single page. So uh, $45,000 for that. Reservoir Road, 
$200,000 right now is proposed. Uh, we tried to get this considered as a FEMA project, but they said no, you can't really point to any disaster that happened there. So this is the road that goes from Route 100 into the State Park in Waterbury Center, right in the dip opposite Hall Road, um, Highway Avenue. Um, and if you drive in there, you'll notice that the, the guardrail is really a curve now. The guardrails are just sinking that whole banking is sloughing out and going down. Um, we thought this has been going on for a number of years, uh, about, I don't know, man, it's a long time. Now, I want to say it's at least 10 years. Uh, there was some, some thought that maybe the water line was leaking uh, and BFUD, um, when Alec was the public works director, the village of Waterbury Water Department, we actually, discontinued the water line that went from Route 100 down to serve the state park and a couple of houses that are there. And we moved the water line up the hill, came from, what is it, Sunset, the first, the Sunset. neighborhood that's across that from the cemetery yeah. there. Um, Lakeview. Lakeview. So Lakeview, I guess it is. So Lakeview Terrace is served by the water system and uh, Walter Luce's house out at the end of Lakeview Terrace. We actually went from, we got an easement from him and we, we rerouted the water line and went down over there and discontinued the water line uh, on, on the reservoir road and nothing changed. So it wasn't the water line that was causing uh, any of this be able to happen. Does the um, town road there go just up to the up to where the berm is? You know, where the they town have the road, gate? The town road ends right in the vicinity of that little parking area on, yeah, on the right. Right before uh, the just berm uphill and from the, the uphill from the gate. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we need to do something there at some point. That road is, is going to uh, just slide mm -hmm. down the hill. Um, and this is a pretty good estimate that I believe Bill Woodruff has asked uh, Spencer Donald and maybe Kingsbury uh, about how much it would cost to do this. Um, you know, does it have to happen in 2022? Probably not, but it's going to have to happen sometime. So I, I put it in here and uh, we can. Talk more about that later. So before we flip the page, can you talk a little bit about having these fund balances that end so in the black and in the red? Or yeah, sorry, in the black and the comfort level from your perspective for scenarios like that? Yeah. Well, what what I haven't done, and I didn't bring the time report either, but um, so I've. I've only shown you funds 70 through 74 here. Um, in the town report, um, if 75 was there, at the bottom of 75, it says aggregate um, spending, aggregate revenues, aggregate revenue minus expenses, aggregate fund balance. So <laughs> fund 70 through fund, um, 75 had a fairly significant aggregate fund balance last year. So if you flip the page, Mark, since you're asking about that. Yeah, I saw the fire vehicle. The fire vehicle CIP is way up. So what we're doing really is we used to have one CIP. It was fund 30 and everything was in it. Frankly, I think that's the way it should be. Uh, Rebecca Ellis was the driving force to breaking them apart because she wanted to know how much we had to put in these funds. But if you try to keep every one of these funds always in the black, you're going to end up having to put a lot more money aside than we've been doing. So we pretty much 
break it apart by fund, but we're still behaving as if it's just one fund in terms of the aggregate. I will tell you right now, uh, with everything that I've done, and even though Fund 75 isn't here, um, we need to put more money in these funds than I'm showing if we're going to do all these projects, because otherwise it's going to be a, a small deficit. Um, and, and that's a little bit of a, um, it's a little bit of a, shell game because as I told you before, we're pretty flush in cash right now. We've got lots of fund balances in a lot of different places. So would I be real worried if we went forward in 2022 having um, uh, a year end uh, projection of a small deficit in all the capital funds? Not really because we've got the money in other places to cover it. Um, but uh, you know it's it's a it's a reasonable point. So anyway, um, I did flip the page to just keep going. Fund seventy two. These are our highway vehicles, and uh, I did highlight both the things you asked about, um, Chris. Uh, to me, the Harley Rake uh, and. Hmm, I don't know why I put 15,000 for the Harley, Harley rate. She has 8,000. I think it's, she wants 8,000 to come out of the rec budget too. So I just put it all in here. The, the rec CIP uh, pays for, has revenue going into the highway vehicle CIP for mowers and the like. So I think the cost is $15,000 for the Harley rate. Their cost of rec eight thousand dollars. I got to. I'll have to ask if it's fifteen or eight. Anyway, the Harley rake. Um, I've never heard of it before. Um, one of the. I, I know the term York rake, which is often used on roads after graders go and it, you know pulls off some of the stones and big cobbles. Uh, the Harley rake. They really like it for the recreation fields for the infields of the softball field and the library field in particular, because they get it all prepared in the spring and then, you know, weed seeds get in there and they start growing up. And if you, they've got a rake right now, they drag the fields, but it's a pretty light screen thing that they pull across and it, um, it doesn't really pull up the, the the roots of the weeds that are, are going in there. So the Harley rate, it's an ask, do we need it? We've lived a long time without it and uh, they seem to play baseball fine, but I, I just put it in here. The 10 ton roller, I have, frankly, I have a bigger question about the 10 ton roller than I have about the Harley rate. It's $68,000. Um, and I think what happened is that uh, because Jay McDonald got one around, that's the big vibratory roller that he's using on the Main Street project, they did uh, were generous and allowed us to use it a few times when, when we had things going on. Um, Celia said that, um, that a number of communities now when they buy new graders, actually buy a roller, not a 10 ton roller, but they buy a roller that can attach to the back of the grader that when they grade the road, uh, when, they, when they do the final pass and uh, you know get it crowned and everything else when they're ready to go, that they, that they pull that roller along to just try to roll out the road. Um, and uh, you know, the, the 10 ton roller would be available for that and be available to roll fields and everything else. Again, I, I, I just put it in here. Uh, Celia's not here. Bill Woodruff isn't here. I'm not saying we don't need it or shouldn't have it, but I have questions about both of those items. So, how many times do they use it and could we not just rent it for the few times that you might really need it? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, again, uh, I don't think we really need it. We've, yeah. we've lived a long time without it. I think it would be nice to have, but, um, you know, uh, there's pressures on the budget. And, you know, if between now and next week, I can get more information from them. I met with them on, on Friday, and if they were here, they could probably uh, answer some of your questions better than I can. But um, I don't think anybody's like jumping up and down saying this is an absolute mistake. All right. So it's it's uh, so you answered my question about the Harley rig. I was thinking to myself, you know, what would they want something like that for? Um, they didn't really answer that question. I just texted a guy who supposedly purchased one. But you can't get it for months and months. <laughs> well, I've had one used on a dirt parking lot at the show when I would have like dips in the dirt. Yeah. They would come in and partly rake the entire parking lot and re, re level it. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. They're used to pick stone. It's basically what it does. It's a, you know, it's a barrel with a, with a bunch of teeth on it and it goes through and basically kicks the stones into the bucket and loosens the material up, picks the bigger stones out, loosens the material up, and then allows you to grade that extra, you know, that loose material off. Um, they put them on skid steers and do driveways with them all the time. Yeah, yeah. 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 They're fairly handy uh, for somebody that's using them, you know, for stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, the roller, I, I was wondering if it was a if it was an independent machine or if it was an, atta wondering. an attachment for the grader. No, it's it's sounds it's, like it's an independent because it's an independent machine. They're not going to be driving the grader around on the rec fields packing packing the fuel down. Right. Uh, now we started to do some like the work that was done on uh, dump coal. We did that paving work, right? Some of that, like we right have we have a three ton coal. Uh -huh. So for for a paving job. You know the patching and stuff that we do the the three ton roller it's a pavement roller we've had that that's in the cip we replaced that i don't know five years ago or something like that this this is a bigger unit and you know again uh, i i'm not sure it's necessary where would we store it that's the other question you know yeah that's a good question have so many I guess my question is: Is there is there a thought on this that this might actually save us money over time by taking on some more middle-sized paving products ourselves? Like, what's the use of this? Is it really for dirt work, or is it for? It would be for anything. I think you could. I think you could roll the the rec fields with it in the spring. You know, when the just after thaws and after it firms up a little bit to try to level the rec fields. I think they would probably, the way they were talking, roll some of the gravel roads after they grade them. And obviously you could use it for, for some paving jobs. Um, but these are questions it seems like I need to ask them and, and bring back. Um, so. Yeah, there's some more information through there. Yes. I mean, I know, you know, when I see it, because I live on one of the dirt areas, that when they do the grading, I could see why maybe a roller would be helpful because if it immediately rains or if it immediately the traffic pattern, all of a sudden it can ruin all that work pretty quickly. Yeah. The, the rain really, yeah. if it rains right after they grade, you yeah. know, it yeah. really not screws it up. Yeah. Um, and she did mention the, the pull behind one. You know, on the graders, but our our grader isn't set up for it, and I think it would be a, from what they said, it would be a fairly expensive um, retrofit thing to retrofit. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Duxbury's got one, and I don't know if they use it as often. The pull behind kind. I think there's a, I've seen one somewhere. It's on the front of the grader, not the back. Uh -huh. uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. All right, I'll get I'll get some answers to 
in both of those questions. So moving on to fund 73, fire vehicles, we don't need any. Um, <clears throat> and the, the, debt, the debt is up. Um, you know, we refinanced. We had that $1.3 million uh, five-year note. We refunded that, turned it into a 15-year bond. So a lot of all, most of the debt lines in the CIP have adjusted and jumped up. <clears throat> We've got four more years left on the, what was a uh, uh, $266,000 allowance. So what we had was 1.3, Six six, I believe, was our initial five-year note. We refunded and turned one point one of that into a fifteen-year note, and the remaining two hundred sixty-six will be paid off in five years. The first payment on that was made in December, so we've got four years to go on on that. Note. So that that was <coughs> that was for the two pump trucks <coughs> and the pump truck. Is that? It was for the two. It was for the two pump trucks. It was for the roadside mower. Uh, there was a couple of other smaller things involved in that. And basically, I I moved it around into different funds uh, where where I thought it made made sense. So some of that. Oh, the other was uh, Main Street was you know the three year project. Uh, our local share of that three-year construction project will pay that over the 15-year time frame. Um, and then Fund 74, uh, again, nothing in here, but this is one of the places, Chris, that we are trying to build up that fund balance. So transferring 27,250 to this fire station fund, Last year, we spent $8,000 on the Maple Street station. That siding cost a little bit more than we had planned. Um, so we're trying to build some fund balance up in this fire station fund. The debt for the fire station is in the fire operating budget shared with anything else. So that's really it for, <clears throat> for now. I just had a quick question on the reservoir road. Uh, who did the evaluation on the fix of that? And there's, there's, do you have any information on what they're thinking of that they're going to do there? Or is that something that's yeah, I, I'll have to, I'll have to bring back more information. I know that uh, we've had, because I worked on that thing years ago. We had some, uh, on some of the FEMA people came and looked. I think we had some engineering work done there. Um, Alex been involved in it. And as far as the work itself, um, I believe they got an estimate from McDonald and perhaps Kingsbury. Uh, and I don't know exactly what they're going to do, but they've got to get down near the brook and try to stabilize that till somehow. Um. I think I talked to you earlier about it here before the meeting started, but the, the vaccine mandate at the United States Canadian border, one of the things, two of the things that they said would impact, could impact our country uh, pretty significantly is concrete and asphalt. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, at least. Hopefully, it will. Hopefully, we'll be able to go forward with our infrastructure projects without too much additional costs and too much delay. Maybe you had a question. Yeah, um, I might have missed it because uh, I wasn't here for Gary's <coughs> presentation last week. What is the uh, Maple Street improvement right here for the station? What was it? Yeah, you know, yeah, it was the site, it was the site of the, on the building. There's like a small building, it looks like it's just been put up back there. Do you know anything about that? The back of the station there? Like a separate shed of sorts? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, there's so much siding on the Maple uh, Street building. That's the cement hardy, hardy plank siding and 
the manufacturers recommend their, they won't warranty it if you don't leave it in space, and like an eighth of an inch, and then cross between the joints. You're supposed to put a piece of metal flashing behind, of course, when you're leaving the side apart, it's exposing what's behind there for weather infiltration. You're supposed to put a piece of flashing in behind there. Uh, the contract will only put a membrane behind there, which has, has fallen out in a lot of the cases exposing uh -huh. material behind it. Uh, I don't know what they did to fix that, but um, then had to recock the, the joint. Uh, I've used that product several times, and I said, the hell with the, the manufacturer's recommendation. I put it tight together. I never had a problem with it, you know. But uh, so not only did they leave the gap, but that stuff uh, under extreme heat will shrink even more. So <laughs> just compounds the problem. But uh, <coughs> so we, I, we noticed it there a while back. And one of those maintenance things, you know, you better stay on top of it. You're going to be replacing the sheathing behind it. So that's what that cost went for. So I haven't, I haven't finalized the, the rec CIP budget. One of the things that I was struggling about was you and Dan and Mark were at the rec committee meeting last week and we were talking about um, you know this um, master planning up at, at uh, Oak Bay Field. We've also got folks from interested in the skate park and they're talking about master planning down at the ice center. And I was trying to figure out, you know, how I was going to get that in the budget and the other things that they're asking for in the rec budget. So I just I just ran out of time, uh, especially after I had to go deal with that heating issue. Uh, so I'll bring the rec budget next week. I'll get uh, the rec CIP budget next week and I'll get uh, some answers to some of these questions about the roller and the, the rig uh, and, and the $200,000 for the, the reservoir road. And hopefully we'll be able to put things to bed. What I'd like to do right now, and I, I did not bring uh, paper copies of this, but if Carla can uh, put up the general budget that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, which is the general operating budget uh, funds 11, 12, and 13. I just want to show you a couple things. So here it is right now. And the, the three budgets with all of the transfers to the REC CIPs and everything else, um, there on the right, you see in 2021, um, $2,172,485 was the tax request in the general fund. Uh, to the left there in the proposed 2022, right now it's 2112 uh, which is down almost $60,000 from last year. And then the highway budget, uh, in 21 was 1.4 million. Right now, what we just looked at tonight is 1.55 million. The library budget was 438,000 and it's 485. So if you approve this budget right now, as is with no other changes, um, uh, it would be a 2.7% increase. We'd need 112,000. $435 more this year than last year. I think we're going to have a fairly reasonable increase in the grant list. I think it will be more than 1%. So that won't translate into a 2.7% increase in the taxes, in the tax rate, I don't believe. But I want to show you some things that I've built into this where I believe that this might be too high in terms of taxes. Now, one thing I just told you that we to balance the CIP funds, we're going to need more transfers in. So that will make the 2022 column go up a little bit. 
uh, to do that. But you can see here um, for the pilot line last year, um, where the yellow highlight is, Carla, for the pilot line, 160,000 was budgeted in the general fund last year. And I think in the CIP fund, um, <clears throat> we budgeted 20,000. We put the 20,000 into the CIP fund. Uh, so we budgeted 180 last year. Uh, we got 337.65. So this year, <clears throat> I'm budgeting 350 right now, which might be a little high based on the three. Well, we got 350 last year. That says 254. Well, it says right. 250 there, but next to it says oh, okay. 100,000. I thought you were pulling 100 out of that. He's stating that there's 20,000. That's not represented here, so it's really right. Like so a, last yeah. year we got 350, mm -hmm. 765, <clears throat> and I'm budgeting 350 again right now. 250 here and 100 to the CIP folks. So if you scroll down, Carolyn, um, go down to one. Chris, for example, or Rex before he was mentioned on one of these that said pilot for revenue was thirty-five thousand. What was that one on? Saving was thirty-five, I think. Yes, yeah, so uh, bring it in. That's how that hundred comes into the CIPs in revenue side. So here, Pete, I'm sorry, where the twenty thousand, where that twenty thousand went. So it's 350 to 330. It's on, CIP it's budget. Oh, right. Pilot. $20,000. All right. Thank you. And then he's got 35. Right. So it wasn't a transfer. It was we put 100, we budgeted for 160. We got 330 there and 20 went into the CIP. <laughs> so I was talking about 250 here. So mm -hmm. that would be a a ninety thousand dollar increase in the general fund revenue, and and it would be an eighty thousand dollar increase into the CIPs because it went from twenty to one hundred to one hundred. Mm -hmm. Bill, why not just represent it as the full payment into that line item, like line sixteen? So say it just said three fifty, and then increase the transfer out. Transfer. You can do that. Yeah. You know that that's. That's six and one half. Right. Well, I know, but for you know, they understand this. But <laughs> right. I, I, know, see, I, know, I know exactly. General what you're public, and I said, where is this twenty thousand dollars? It's not easy to understand that. Right. Yeah, so, so if you want to do that, we can do that. Yeah. I understood that as a two fifty. You were budgeting two fifty, and out of that two fifty, you were pulling one hundred. Two fifty going into the no. CIP. No. That's what I was thinking. No, um, and this is this is just notes for you. So if you if if you think I, that's clearer, I I would think that's clear because you know I think if, in terms of like normal town people looking at our you know when they get the budget and the yeah. booklet that they're gonna want. I would like that to be very clear what we're pulling in for pilot, and I feel like without it being right there in that line item, yeah. they might think that the twenty thousand or thirty-five thousand is coming out of that, not in addition yeah. to. That, that's fine. Yeah. If, if that makes it clear, I'm happy to do that. A couple of clicks on the computer. <laughs> um, so the same thing with current use there, right in the middle of the page, just to the left, right, right there. Uh, we budgeted 35 last year. We got 106. So I'm budgeting 105 this year. And the uh, line right above it, Forest and Parks, $30,000 was budgeted. We got 91,660. So I'm budgeting 91,660 again. Both of those changes were state level changes that we had nothing to do with. And all of a sudden, we just got more income. Well, no, we budgeted less. We got 90 in 2020. I was fearing that we weren't going to yeah, get right. the state appropriation. So that's one of the reasons, you know, where and we, we reduce spending as well. Um, the state grant, uh, VTrans liaison, that money's going away. That was what the state was reimbursing us for what Barb Farrow was doing so that that's a loss of revenue but we have a fairly significant loss of spending mm -hmm. as well um if you go down to the next uh town clerk service fees and all that stuff um so the this is where the rec revenues are significant significantly higher than they were last year and remember 
um, those rec revenues offset spending, but if the revenues don't come in, the programs won't be run. So it doesn't happen. So it's you know you're not going to be able to eliminate all of the spending. But you know if if he's got um, you know that mini camp, he's got eighty one thousand five hundred dollars there uh, as proposed revenue. And if something happens and we only get fifty thousand dollars, we're we're going to have a corresponding reduction in spending. So that's not very risky there. Um, if you move down uh, to the, where the yellow highlight is, Carolyn. So from tax stabilization fund, uh, we budgeted 50 for a transfer this year. We didn't, we didn't take it in 2021. We talked about that last week. I do have 52,600. Uh, Chris, if you just pass these around. Um, So, in effect, our when you see this, um, I'll wait till you all get it. So, in so on the front page, there, uh, that was the uh, the total gain that we had in the. You can see in the income and expense report, we had no expenses. We didn't transfer the $50,000, but we had a gain of 54,578 in interest and, and security gains. So if we, and if you look at the second page, <clears throat> you'll see there down toward the bottom of the page where it's one, two, three, four lines up from the bottom, the fund balance, in at the end of 2020, and this fund was 997,728. <clears throat> it's up to 1,052,000 now. So if we had transferred the 50 last year, it still would have been, we would have had more in the fund at the end of this year than we had at the end of last year. And we still could transfer 5%. So our fund balance moving into 2022 in our general fund is fifty thousand dollars lower than it needed to be. We chose not to make that transfer. If we wanted to make it, we could double our transfer from this year. It, it's a wash. It would be the same as if we did it last year. And this handwriting here is just it's for my information, just telling us that you know we don't have a lot at risk right now in this uh, tax stabilization fund. Only twelve percent. Of that million fifty two thousand is in equities. The rest is in fixed income or cash. Or cash. And the um, the interest on investments is that other the loans to us? The interest on those loans? Part of it, yes. It's also interest. We've got bonds and, and other fixed income. But yeah, you know, the the interest that the CIP funds are paying to us. So you can see there that four hundred ninety. $9,300 of where it says advanced to other funds up at the top of the page. You see it? So that's that's tax stabilization money that has been actually lent to the other CIP funds and they're paying 2.75% interest to us right now. Um, so 3% uh, of uh, $500,000 would be what, 15. Uh, so yeah, the, some of that interest is is from the other funds. But can I ask you a question before we get to yeah, here? Yeah. If I, I lose track. <clears throat> so based on what you had budgeted your way at the top, you said if we pass the budget right now, here's what we're looking at. What you're telling us right now is part of that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's not. If we add this in with it, this no, no, is this is all. Okay. This is everything that I'm going over okay. now gets us to that point, and that's and that's also including this taxation yeah. stable yeah. doubling of it. No, no, just just that fifty-two thousand. Okay. But you're saying that we could take that other fifty if we wanted. To yeah. That. So yeah, and this is what, this is where I'm going to get now. <laughs> so. Um, 
Let's not look at those two lines in blue and, and pink yet or red. <clears throat> Carolyn, go down uh, to the special articles budget. Which is down several pages. Yeah. Keep going. Okay, stop. So yeah. you, you just went past it. Right. Um, a little, a little higher. Right here. So in the budget that I at the top of the page where I said that we had a two percent, two point seven percent tax increase. So here there's our fifty six, fifty seven thousand dollars. So last year our special articles were fifty six thousand nine hundred dollars. You can see the friends of the reservoir here when I got a petition. We paid them a thousand dollars last year, but from the general fund budget because they didn't have time to go out and with uh, oh. with COVID and everything else, we just put that thousand dollars somewhere else in the budget. But they went out, got signatures, and they're asking for a thousand. So fifty six nine was what our budget was last year. You know, one of those gets three dollars instead of five, so fifty six eight ninety eight. So with this additional thousand dollars, that would be fifty seven thousand nine hundred in the budget. This is fifty thousand dollars that I just threw in there right now to deal with the planning at Pope Davy. The you know Mark and Danny were here at the rec committee meeting last week. They have a $35,000 budget on a fairly loose scope right now that I think needs to be tightened up. So $35,000 there, and I added $15,000 if we needed to do some planning down at the ice center spot. So that wasn't in our budget last year. That's five sevenths of a cent on that tax rate at the top. Here's the $600,000 that I'm proposing that we pay EFUD for the uh, mobile home park, the water lines there. And here's $100,000 that I'm proposing to the ice center that we talked about last week. So there's 50, $750,000. Now go back up to the to the revenues at the top, Carla. Right. Yeah, I don't know why that thing. I can't drag it up. All right. So, go down a little bit. So, right here, <clears throat> I've got as a revenue from ARPA. So we've got $770,000, $775,000 in ARPA funds right now. We're going to get another $775 sometime in the next couple of months. So we're going to have $1.5 million of ARPA money. Um, that six hundred thousand dollars, if we transfer out of the ARPA fund into the general fund, that will offset the money to E fund. So there's no no impact on the taxes for that six hundred thousand dollars. And for that, I hope we can end up merging the two communities together. But um, you know, the E fund commissioners have already said, even if we don't merge, if we get that money to them. They'll give the town a revolving loan fund. The pink line that says transfer in from Ar ARPA for lost revenue. Okay, so I've told you a couple of times in the past the rules that go along with ARPA say that you can use ARPA funds for a limited amount of things. Um, no surface transportation issues, so no roads, no bridges, because that's in Biden's 
infrastructure plan, but you can use it for water and sewer and solar and you know hydro, uh, geothermal or whatever you want to use it for. But there's a provision that says if you can prove that you had lost revenue between 2019 and 20 and between 2020 and 21, you can you can use ARPA money to replace that lost revenue. So I've done the calculation already. I should have looked at it before I came in here tonight to, uh, to uh, have the exact number, but we have several hundred thousand dollars of lost revenue just between 19 and 20. I haven't done the 20 to 21 yet because the 21 budget is just being finalized now. So that lost revenue provision says that you don't have to have any special um, uh, public meetings. You don't have to have any special votes. Uh, you can simply use that lost revenue that the ARPA funds to replace that lost revenue, basically using as, as if you collected those revenues in the past and it was part of your fund balance. So we could move into this line item there that says transfer in ARPA lost revenue. If we put $100,000 in there, that, that offsets the $100,000 going to the ICE Center, which isn't funded right now except through taxes. And if you put that in there, then your taxes at the top are gonna to drop by $100,000. Um, if we put more in there for lost revenue now, <clears throat> above and beyond that $100,000 to the ICE Center, um, let's say we've got, I think it's 300 and something thousand dollars that I calculated in lost revenue. And it I got a whole tool that was built by our accounting firm, Memrick and BLCT. And uh, the government finance offices of America all, you know, built this tool. So I'm confident that it's, it's accurate and correct. So we could put on that line, <clears throat> any number, that adds up to not exceed the lost revenue. And I've only done the lost revenue calculation for one year right now. So we could put money on that line and we could easily get money into the capital funds to do, you know, to, to, um, to raise the fund balances in those capital funds that you're concerned about. So the bottom line question I have for you right now is, what is your hope for a tax rate for 2022? Um, do you want to keep it at what was it last year? 53 cents? I can't remember. Yeah. And a half. 52. We went from 55 to 51 and 20, and then we, I think it was 53. I think, it, no, no, we, we didn't maintain it. We, we bumped it up. So, if you want to have the same tax rate, you can do that. Um, if you want to have a reduced tax rate, you can probably do that. If you want to live with a tax rate that increases by a couple percent, you know, right now, as I told you, inflation is going about 5% right now. And at some point, this money is going to kind of go away. So I think maybe. At best, you'd want to keep the tax rate exactly the same. I don't think if it went up 2%, anybody would complain about it. But what I'm trying to tell you is that you've got some flexibility and you need to, if you tell me now what you want for a tax rate, then I can work over the next week and bring that back. But uh, there's some of these things that we can do that won't cost the taxpayer anything in terms of its taxes right now. Uh, well, can I ask you the question there on the, if you're gonna claim lost revenue and you're saying you're saying that you can claim lost, lost revenue from 19 and 20, would that be the, because you budgeted so much less? 
you know, revenue lines coming from the state. No. I was going to say because we so ended, what up, they we ended do, up getting that. You know, what they do is they look at, they're not worried about what you budget is, Chris. They're worried about what you've got. So when we looked at our 19, so the, the way this tool works, the revenue that we received for 2019, which was the year before COVID, right? The last quote unquote normal year we had, the revenue is all there. And let's just say it adds up to $5 million. The next column says actual 2020. It doesn't say budget 2020, it says actual 2020. And it basically compares the revenue in column A to the revenue in column B. And if column B is lower than it was in column A, it's lost revenue. But the way the federal rule is written, you'll love this, Chris, because I know how much you like the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> if your revenue stream didn't increase by at least 4%, they consider it a loss. <laughs> so you could have a million dollars revenue in 2019, and it should have gone up 4%. So if you have a million, what's 4% of a million? 40,000. 40, so if you have a million 39,000 for next year, you've got a thousand dollars less revenue, even though your revenue went up $39,000. So do they allow you just to make up the difference or do they allow you any number you want? Yeah, to they, you, you're allowed to make up the difference. So, so, so this is why back in December, the night that I announced that I was going to retire, <laughs> if you remember, I said that this ARPA funding had the ability to help us be transformational. And one of the things was the deal with EFUD. And one of the things was trying to put the ICE Center on a footing that allows them to continue on as a private not-for-profit. Now, speaking of that, by the way, they're going to come here to talk to the whole select board next week on Monday night. So you don't have to worry about only two of you are going to be able to, to hear from them and ask questions. So anyway, I'm kind of looking for some guidance from you right now. What are you looking to see for a tax rate? I'm not asking you to approve the ICE Center thing tonight. You kind of indicated before, at least Mike said, well, if we're going to do it, it should be a special article. That's where I had budgeted it already. Um, <clears throat> that can be done without, without any pain to the, to the taxpayer. And if you don't use the money, the lost revenue money, um, Oops, sorry. that's okay. Um, you know, that, that $1.5 million that we're going to have from ARPA, and if you do appropriate the 600000 to EFUD, you're going to have $1.1 million after that. Right, can you go up to the top, please? You're going to, um, you have until 2024 to figure out how you want to use the ARPA funds. Uh, we're not going to figure it all out in this budget season. I would recommend that, you know, once we get through this budget season, um, well, it'll depend. If we're going to try to write a charter to merge the communities, maybe you push off discussing how you're going to use the Apple money until 2023. You've got a couple of years to decide how you're going to use it. You don't have to use it all this year, and you don't even have to decide how you're going to use it all this year. You've got to decide by 2024, and you have to spend it by 2026. So can I ask another stupid question? By you, Budgeting six hundred thousand for e fund, budgeting hundred thousand for the ice center. Is that your way of creating lost revenue in a sense? No, no. It's, that's my way of spending some spending. Uh, no, I'm saying it's not creating lost revenue, that, so that you can use the ARPA to replace it. No, losses of it's not revenue. Heard. That's an expense. Revenue is right. revenue is revenue. The, the top, the so the so I'm trying doing, to figure out where he's, where he's getting the, he's, the claims. So we have this ARPA money that came in. We can't really bring it onto our books until we have a legal way to follow the rule book to expend it. So basically what he's doing is he's 
spending six hundred thousand to e flood and then bringing that in as revenue to offset it. Right. So I just net, said no, 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 no. But it's not, it's not creating lost revenue. It's see this, not creating see this lost column. Revenue. Assume that said two thousand nineteen up there, right? So go down to the bottom of that column, Charlie. The bottom of the revenue. So right there. This is all. This is revenue, right? It's not spending anything, right? That's tax money, grant money, uh, recreation fees, and everything. Three million sixty-seven thousand dollars. So let's say that was. Let's say this was the 2019 call for revenue. Mm -hmm. Let's say this is the 2020 call for revenue. No spending. Three two four eight three zero six seven. So rounded off, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of lost revenue, right? So that's the it's revenue that we didn't collect. Now you have the ability to spend some of that revenue, so you can put it in you to your revenue. You reimburse yourself. You you put it into your through the ARPA money. Yeah, you you. You use the ARPA money to replace that revenue that you had before that you lost, and it's available now for you to spend. So, so it's not putting if that, that if the money, six hundred thousand and the hundred thousand weren't line items before, they are now. There was never any revenue source for either of those, but you, but. But I'm using we have had losses using, and you're going to spend some money. We've got oh, 1.5 million dollars of ARPA money sitting there. It can be used for infrastructure things, water, sewer, solar, uh, housing, probably. Uh, you can't use it for bridges, you can't use it for paving, you can't use it for culverts. So that's where the 600 is coming from. Mm -hmm. So right. you take you can say, and if we didn't have lost revenue, right? If I went through that exercise and there was, if we had not lost revenue between 2019 and 2020, we couldn't do this. We couldn't use it right. this way. Right. We would have to work with the public. We'd have to say, well, we're going to do XYZ water project or XYZ sewer project. But the federal government has allowed you to use that to make up lost revenue. So all you have to do is go through your normal budgeting process, which we're doing now. Chris, you could use that lost revenue for anything. We could throw a party for Bill, you know, with that money. You know, well, it's, I wouldn't recommend that. Well, I'm not being a little facetious, but you could do anything you know once you show you've had that loss then it's basically it's like your money and, and that's and you why can decide what to do with it and that's why i'm saying that the six hundred thousand dollars there offsets the spending that i proposed to eat by if you put fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars on that pink line that would offset the spending that i proposed for the ice center but but the six hundred thousand is not lost revenue right, spending. Right. That's, That's just spending for water mm -hmm. infrastructure. You're right. going to so make that a sub right. so that one should open. Every time you do a spend like that, there should be an offsetting expense. So that that particular line item fits the category of right. that. The blue line, the blue one fits, you could fits spend the money. category. So you the red one. Give it to an organization. Um, and you know you could probably make the ice center fit the category. Yeah, it's a not-for-profit. You could do it, but I, you know, I was trying to see. I thought we could fund the ice center that hundred thousand dollars without using any ARPA money at all, and I think I proved that you can. I mean, it's right now we've got a a modest tax rate increase, not using any ARPA money. For that hundred thousand dollars to the ice center, but if you don't want a modest tax increase, you can put a hundred thousand dollars there. If you want to get more money into your CIP funds, you can put some more money on that line item, and and it's fine. So we have a lot. Of, all I'm trying to say is we've got a lot of flexibility for the first time, really. Ever. Bill, can you remind the board? So two percent 
just to the board note, two percent is a one one cents on the tax rate. Um, so it would be a fifty four cent. Can you remind the board how much that would bring in in terms of additional revenue? Well, I, I, I two percent go up to the very top. So just when we're talking through these different mm -hmm. scenarios, of what the mean. Uh, so if you go to the very top. You see that the tax rate, the tax increase is 112,435, right? Yep. 112,435 mm. divided into 4,039,610 is 2.78%. 112,000 dollars. A penny on the grand list raises about 80,000 dollars. So that would be what a penny and a third, or something like that, on the tax rate. So I'm just trying to get an idea of what you want your tax. So rate if to we be. put that hundred k in as the like a reimbursement for the <coughs> funds, we would be able to approve this budget as is without a tax increase. Yeah, if you so put the hundred thousand dollars on that line coming from APA to fund the ice center mm -hmm. deal, that one twelve four thirty five would drop to. To twelve four thirty five, and if you wanted to put more money into the CIPs, which I think we're going to need to do, even if we take out and if we take that two hundred thousand dollars for the reservoir road out this year, you probably don't have to put a lot more money in the CIPs. But at some point, you're going to have to do the reservoir road, yeah. right? So, um, I guess my recommendation is that. I don't think it's a good idea to lower the tax rate below what it was last year. Mm -hmm. Because if you lower the tax rate, you give up that tax revenue, and at some point you're going to have to raise it just to get back up to where you were. So I wouldn't lower it, but. Uh... Well, I have a, maybe a procedural question. I can't remember how we did it last year. On all those special articles, as we talked about. You know some of the things going in special articles. With some of the sp small special articles, how we used to at town meeting group them, we didn't do that. Everyone has a yay or nay. Everyone was voted on last year, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. I just couldn't remember. No, we can't. You can do can't. it if you can, but it doesn't seem fair. Yeah, I, mm. it's. I wouldn't do it. I no, I think it's, it's fair to lump someone together and not others. I think, that was I think we did it at policy. town meeting. We did time. it at town meeting on the line. So we could bring $100,000 of lost revenue into this budget to basically land at 53 cents again. And if. Well, I think you if you brought $100,000 into this budget, then you're going to have a, if you have a grand list increase, you, you know, so. Might end up with you'd have a lower tax rate. Okay. So what did you say the ARPA portion for this year is seven What? What did you say the ARPA two ARPA portion? Seven. Seven. We, we have seven hundred and seventy-five thousand in the bank right now. And we'll be getting another seven seventy-five. And right now, based on what you proposed, you're spending most of that. Six. Well, six, we're spending seven. most of. The 775, but when the other one comes, you'll still no, have a million dollars this year. So, I guess to, to complete my question, if you were to bring the 100,000, just this is with no discussion around grand list growth, because maybe we can do 53 cents and just hope the grand list covers that shortfall, mm -hmm. right? Um, but basically, after the conversation next week with the ICE Center, if we as a board feel like we want to put a special article request of $100,000 to the ICE Center and it gets voted down, that just means that we would have revenue tax. It wouldn't change our taxation rate because that would be as part of the voting, right? Yeah, if, 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 um, for my, the way I would do it is if, if we've got a hundred thousand dollars coming from our phone and a hundred thousand dollar special article to the ice center, if the hundred thousand dollar special article fails, I would transfer that hundred thousand over. I just leave it. 
in the upper part of Canada. <clears throat> That hundred thousand dollars to the ice center is probably going to be one of the more controversial things. And I think at the special meeting, we really need to explain. Well, you haven't even decided if you're going to do it. Well, I know, but if, if, if we that. decided to do that, I'm just saying, you know, when you have big numbers, big numbers come with more, or unless they're big numbers like a whole budget where people can't understand them. But when they know a single item, they know what it is and they, have opinions for or against a lot of that. Yeah, I understand, and, and that's well, and I think that's <laughs> that's where I was feeling. On that level, I think if we had open town meeting, you can explain it better and exactly. make people understand that you're not going to be. This isn't going to hurt at all. I mean, right. you can write the article in such a fashion that people should know that it's not going to add to the tax burden, but they're still going to see that 100,000, they're right. still going to see the ice on it. So it might not pass, I understand. Yeah, I, I, I would think they'd be more inclined to believe that for some reason that town's thinking on the ice center, you know, as part of the... Oh, yeah. Anytime so, you have a big number, you know, anything from, Fifteen to thirty thousand dollars. People have more questions, and, and that's and that's why you know. I mean, I put it in the special articles right now, but it doesn't have to be in the special articles. It can just be in the budget. Um, Does anybody want the tax rate to go down for next year? And remember, the school tax rate. I'm not blaming them, but that's probably going to go up. So I, right, know, that's, exactly. That's. <laughs> anybody i mean i think we all realistically would love to see our tax rate go down uh, but, but ideally even if our town tax rate went down if you're going to see the school go up you're going to see a net payment increase but of course, you know but last year i don't you know i you guys just surprised me all the time because last year we went from an approved budget in 2020 that required 55 cents. We cut it that year and raised the 51 cent tax rate. I came in here with a budget last year at 51 cents, didn't have to go up. And you said, well, we yeah, can't have a tax rate good. that we've got to add something, something because we don't want to wanna just, just you know, have, have that go up double, double in, in the future. future. So, so that now I'm thinking that 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 Maybe, Maybe by this time next week, week I'll know what the 2020, 2020 loss revenue is. And yeah, I've got to ask a few questions. So, so that, that was a question, question to me is how long is this ARPA money available? Well, the ARPA money is there. The ARPA money is going to be $1.5 million. You have it until 2024 to decide how you're going to spend it. And you have until 2026 to spend it. The interesting thing about that, we all got big, big Amazon cards. Well, and I think it. Bill, I, I, I want to know where for, for the six hundred thousand dollars you buy. Sounds, sounds like, like you know, originally, originally this idea, idea sounds like, sound like it was really going to be the six hundred thousand dollars basically acquire the assets of E five and merge them and get the revolving loan bond. I just, I just want, want to understand, understand exactly what that six hundred thousand dollars is, and, and what are your concerns? How that works legally? Because it sounds like there's some allocated, allocated projects, projects that, 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 that would go over. I understand the infrastructure the component of the water system as a trailer park, some, some of these other projects. I just want to understand as we go into town meeting day. That, that merger, merger is really, really going to be in place, place right? Right, right. 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 So but the $600,000 is an transfer, basically. The proposal that I made originally was $600,000 for e to use the water project in 
in exchange for the revolving loan funds. And, and that's, 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 that's it. it. So, so and that, that was happen. Problem, then. <laughs> What's that? That's so, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say this, this, but, but at the last, last, at the last, last meeting, meeting we had, yeah. when I said, I don't, I don't recall merging with you, taking the water and sewer. You recall wrong. And then what I said was when I had the idea, that, that was, was what, what it was, was going, going to be. To I, think I think that that, 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 that exchange, exchange alone is it's, it's worthwhile. Uh, I don't see that the town loses anything. The town doesn't have any, any risk in, in any of it. But, but if, if you read the memo that I gave you that day, Chris, it goes on to say, and oh, by, by the way, I think the next step of this should be to merge. And then if I want to merge, they don't. They, they want this. And does that merge come at any cost? Well, I mean, I guess, I guess it couldn't come at any cost because, because we would, would, if we paid them, they would be in our balances and we merge, right? right? right. It doesn't, yeah. right? right. Yeah. So, there's, 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 there's no, no, it's just the beginning, beginning of that, but also, because because the water system lives in a separate entity, the ARPA money came through the town, the only way that you can access it is through our money to that money. Um, so, so am I trying to bring a, 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 a 53 cent tax rate? Yeah. A 53 cent tax rate would probably raise more money than it did last year because there's going to be more less things. Yeah, I'm saying that. I wouldn't be supportive of higher purchase amounts that you need to sound like knowing that we have more part of the money to. Balance, balance and, and there's, there's a chance, chance depending, depending on, on what you know, happens with this budget, budget that we might not have the uh, tax stabilization we get. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah, 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 So, the ARPA money, we need to speak to the infrastructure, the ability for that money to be use for infrastructure is it infrastructure in the broader sense or is it certain types of it's what, what I know that we can't do with it except for the large revenue aspect of it is that you can't use that for what we typically on the other side of things think of as infrastructure. So you can't, you can't use it for any surface transportation stuff. So roads, bridges, that kind of stuff, you can't use up the money for that at all. Except if you, if you can show lost revenue, revenue <laughs> then and you, you can just, just move it into, into your general fund and then transfer it into your, your CIP. CIP. So, so we will, will be able to bolster our capital funds with this lost revenue. revenue. There's more, more lost, lost revenue, revenue than this hundred thousand dollars that I proposed to the ice. So, so I think it's and and, and, and you know, know it might be a good idea, idea um, once, once I, I figure, figure out, out how much the lost, lost revenue is. I, mean, I don't have a, a, a whole other kind of should do this, should do this or be part of that one, but I'm that, hoping that that the lost sewer system will be kind of soon enough. But you know, the lost revenue. You might, you might want to just get that, that into your, your budget, budget and into, into your capital funds now, now. It's, and it's, 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 it's there, there. And it's it's there. to change the rules. I don't think that And do you, and you want, want a motion for the ICP scheme still on, on uh, uh, the motion from the library, motion that you were asking for earlier? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I think based on what I've just said now, there's no big reason to to not to say, say yes to the library request. I move it. Move to approve, approve the library budget yeah. as proposed. <laughs> 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 I'll second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor, you say aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. It's <laughs> 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 okay. It was a very interesting discussion. Thank you guys for all your effort. Um, <laughs> that you put into all this. Thank you very much. I would have liked to know, Christine. Thanks again. Um, okay, so the and then we don't, we don't need to make a motion. You need to start saying that. Yeah, I'm almost like, like board, 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 board
a level one battery. battery. Okay. Um, um, anything else to see? Maybe? So, so uh, quick, quick update, update from, from the, the rec, rec meeting, meeting we attended. The, the rec, the rec, rec is, is going to be providing, providing a proposal for an agreement between a group that Bill is going to take, take some understanding of your end, and maybe the town, our, our council, council. Okay. 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 on whether or not you can make an agreement that it's not a legal entity of any sort. And how, and how do we do this? this but a lot, a lot of work and a lot, a lot of discussion, discussion went into every line item of this agreement. It seemed like, like for the most part, the folks, folks who are participating in this call agreed, agreed to basically it's not going to be a law or a rule book anymore. They can go in there and they do whatever they want. And hopefully, maybe, maybe there's going to be a specific plan and management and a liaison of a single person. Uh, from, uh, from the town, it looks like they can make at this point, point but it's left open, open to anyone from the town decides to sign to, to be the liaison, and then they can't go in and make major changes, changes without, without working, working with the town, and, and there's, there's maintenance, maintenance agreements and how much they can maintain, maintain where, and how, and it's, it's, it's pretty detailed. detailed. We'll be able to go through it more, but just wanted to let the group know that that work is being done, and we should be seeing something like it shortly. On that. So, is there a piece? I think there's an easy discussion on committees like that and uh, conflict of interest. I really, I was disappointed again at that meeting in terms of the ability to get through an agenda and feeling like that meeting was not completely directed by people that were trying to make the best, in best interest of the town. I really, I really do think that there's a problem. <laughs> and if, I'm, I'm sure, sure. I, think I think that meeting was reported or suggested that the board members take a look, look at that meeting. And, and there was, was one of the other, I think, because Mark, Mark and I were there, there was a little more <laughs> order, order and stuff than usual, because I would have heard some other tasks. Yeah, I'm concerned of the board not being able to maintain its membership if that continues. Yep. Good. Anyway, yeah. Welcome to the Bureau.